Thank you for joining us this evening. I'd ask you all to please join us in the flag salute. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And first tonight we have some special recognition that the superintendent's going to lead us through. Sorry, look at that. I started without you and you yeah, first. <laughs> Thank you. So good evening everybody. Our recognition this evening is for Karen Sprecher. And I know uh, Karen's in the audience. Um, you can go ahead and stay seated because it's going to be really awkward hearing all these nice things about you if you're standing here. So um, we'll bring you up here in just a second. So I've known Karen for about 15 years, and she's one of those people that you never hear a bad word about. All you hear about her are good things from her past students, from the people that she works with, from the parents. She's one of those teachers that uh, parents request a lot. They, they want their kids in her class. And she's one of those people that exhibits a servant's heart in just a huge way. Um, she's a great listener, she's a great instructor, and she's a great staff member. And she's been in the district for over 20 years now. And uh, she's a third grade teacher at Orenco. And um, I've had the good fortune of being in her class a number of times. And when you're in her class, again, you just, the kids are just so engaged. And it's just a place that you want to be. I've always known that she's an, incred an incredible teacher and that she gets uh, great results with kids. But on April 17th, there was an event that happened that kind of permanently cemented her in my mind as this superhero teacher. Um, while she was on lunch duty, another third grade, our third grader approached her and he couldn't finish his sentence because um, his airway was blocked. He was choking on a chip. And um, we've all been in those situations where there's an emergency and some people, they look around to see who's gonna respond. Other people you know, get uh, overly excited and don't maybe respond appropriately. But uh, some people freeze, other people step in, and so what does superhero Karen do? Um, what she does is uh, she performs the Heimlich and was able to restore his breathing with just one thrust. And um, so successful in fact that um, the, the student was checked out and sent back to class. Didn't even miss any instructions. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the amazing thing about that day though for Karen was I don't even think that was the most amazing thing that happened that day. Um, Karen would tell this story a lot better, but I'm going to try and give it my best. Uh, later in the day, they were in the computer lab. And um, while they were in the computer lab, the lights flickered a couple times. Now, when you're doing folks testing and the lights flicker, that's not a good thing. Um, machines stayed on, the testing continued. And as they were walking back to the classroom hall following that, um, one of her students who had just lost, uh, lost her dad to cancer a few weeks before, um, turns and says to Karen, do you remember when the lights flickered? And uh, do you know who that was? And Karen says, well, who was it, honey? And she says, that was my dad telling me that he's proud of me. So when I think about Karen, not only is she literally saving lives in the lunchroom, <laughs> but she is also saving lives emotionally and socially and standing by the kids. When you have a student like that that's willing to share that with their third grade teacher, who has that connection with their teacher, you know that she's an incredible, incredible gift to Renko and to our community. So, Karen Cumner, and we let us. Thank you. 
approve the agenda. Let's make a motion to approve the agenda. I second. Questions? It's been moved by Jean, seconded by Adriana to approve the agenda as printed. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. And I don't believe this is our audience time, but I don't believe we have any audience requests at this time. Okay, moving right on. Next, I'd be looking for a motion for the consent agenda. I make a motion to approve the con consent agenda. Thank you. I uh, will second that. Perfect. Questions, comments? Yeah, I just had a um, question slash. Yeah, it is a question. Um, I noticed that every month that when we have the consent agenda, we have these full page of these, you know, the donations mm -hmm. and from the businesses and everything that comes through. And I was wondering, because it's a board, I mean, we, we approve the donations. How is that um, done as far as for thank yous? Um, do we know oh, we... Michelle's not here. Um, I think any of them that come to the district, if they're over a certain threshold uh -huh. amount, then they come to the district and then we send out a thank you. If it's below that threshold, I, th I believe the buildings do their own. The buildings do it? Okay. All right. I was just curious because when I see it on there, I think you see a whole page, I mean, um, you know, from businesses and... I've and been tracking that for the last several years. I'll, I'll do a report for you. It's a, it's amazing how yeah. much it's generated. It's right. Nice. And it'd be probably great information for the community to see as well if you really see that in a yeah. lump sum. Yeah, I will put that together for them. And I would think that as you look at those and you kind of see those individual clubs or programs, that those programs are probably doing their own thank yous as well. Well, uh, yeah, right. I thought about that, but I thought about when you think, when you talk about, I mean, one that stuck out to me was, I think, was Butternut Creek. They had um, their PTO. They gave a significant amount of money. And, you know, their parents were very appreciative and staff were appreciative. But I wonder when it looks like a significant oh, amount like that and they're investing in technology, sure. how do we recognize that as... Put together a whole, um, uh, probably There's be a board update so on how we recognize those and then also history of the amounts that have been generated. Thank you. Okay. Monty? The approved consolidated sub grants, mm -hmm. part of the consent agreement, it says that we can uh, available for review. Mm -hmm. Can we get, who do we contact? Get Me. Just, okay. All right. You want to see the actual grants themselves, the sub grants? Yeah, yeah. Uh, we see titles and numbers, but I'm not sure what they mean. So. Okay. Would you post it on Yep. Thank you. Any other comments? Okay, so it's been moved by Janine and seconded by Glenn to approve the consent agenda. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. And this is the first of um, our two action items this evening to approve the revised 2014-2015 um, school calendar. Debbie. Thank you. Um, on March 18th, the board approved the 14-15 school calendar, and that calendar included two budget reduction days. Uh, and then on May 8th, as a result of the increased revenue, the budget committee approved a budget that included only one budget reduction day. So the calendar needs to be revised, the 14-15. And so you have a draft of the 14-15 calendar, and what we've added back is the, the um, March 20th, budget reduction day, so the only budget reduction day will be that day in November. The reason that we added this day back was it better balanced um, the instructional days, and it was less disruption to the overall calendar. Moving all those days around in November would really um, cause some disruption in the current calendar. So can you get a motion, and then we can take any questions or comments? I make a motion to approve the revised 2014-15 school calendar. Thank you. Second. Thank you. Questions or comments about the calendar? Overall excitement that we're adding one more day. <laughs> <laughs> Going in the right direction. <laughs> Anyone else? Okay, so it's been moved by Janine, seconded by Monty. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? The motion carries. Thank you, Debbie. And the next um, action item is to award a bid for emergency egress lighting at us. You'll recall that a couple of months ago we came to you with the first of the packages of egress lighting that required the board um, approval. 
as you recall, we have these projects going on for emergency lighting at each of our buildings, and we package them um, by building um, several buildings in each package. A couple of those packages are meet the threshold that they require board approval, $150,000 threshold. This is the second of those that require board approval um, and the bid results are included in there. Again, these are um, pre-approved contractors, so they meet all of our criteria for um, contracting. We are ready to award at this point. Okay, so I'll be looking for a motion. Well, I'll make a motion to accept uh, the bid. Perfect. And second? Second. Perfect. And then question? Yeah. Yeah, just a quick question. All right, so um, I noticed that there's $48,000 difference, approximately, what, 20, 25% difference in the, in the price of these two uh, bids. Do you have any insight as to why? I, mean, I, I get it, it's their business, not ours, and either way is fine, but any idea why one was so far below the other? Lauren? <laughs> I mean, obviously they're going to hit all of our points that we asked for. Uh, well, Glenn has caused the price, I'm going to be asking this question. And I appreciate you doing so. Um, and again, whenever there's a large difference like that, percentage difference, I always go back to the contractor and say, you need to verify that your price is correct. And it's accurate. I'm not going to hear something later that you forgot to put in your price. Mm -hmm. And in this case, this contractor did that and was perfectly fine with it. That's good enough for me. Thank you. Any other questions or comments, Mike? Uh, this, you said this was the second set? This is the second set that met the threshold that required right. board approval, yes. Was Global the, the contractor on the first set? Who got the first? Somebody else? I think it was Global or Miles. Yeah, we think it was. Okay. Jane? This was for the outside lighting, correct? <coughs> so. Most of it is indoors. There is some exterior lighting. Is some of the exterior, such as like at Emily, where we had the safety issues. Um. That is why inlay is in this group. Mm -hmm. Originally, it was not Thank you. in this group. Thank you. Any other questions? So it's been moved by Glenn, seconded by Eric to approve um, to award the bid for the emergency egress lighting. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries. Thank you, Adam. Thank you, Martin. Appreciate it. Mike, you can do exclusive things. He's sticking around. He wants to hear this presentation. Um, so tonight we're going to start with a couple um, fun reports that are coming from students, and I'll let Mike um, introduce the first one. Thank you. So a couple weeks ago, I received an email from some guys at Century, as did the board, and they wanted to do a presentation to the board on uh, restrooms and hand dryers. So when you see those topics, um, you want to check that out first before they just uh, show up and do a board presentation. So I, did, I went over and I, uh, I met with them and they did their presentation and uh, I was most impressed because they had done their research so well, they had analyzed the cost savings, they had talked about the impact on this particular decision and what it might mean for the school um, on labor and on, and on uh, just the cost, as well as some positive outcomes. So I invited them to participate in tonight's meeting. And so, guys, come on up and uh, walk us through your presentation. All righty. So, um, like uh, Mr. Scott said, we're from Century High School. Uh, we're from the Pac-2 class, which is people assisting the community. Uh, this is our senior project, so we decided that we wanted to do something that would immediately help our school. And also something that's kind of been a, um, I guess not, problem's not the right word, but a nuisance throughout our school years. Um, so I'll let everybody introduce So I'm Josh Taylor. I'm Lawson Barnes. Muriel Ariola. I'm Brian Vega. Alrighty, so we've gathered information about paper towels and just all the stuff from our school secretary and also the janitors. So, and thanks Mike for giving us the opportunity to present here. We're really excited for the new opportunity and a lot and to preparing for it. So we're happy to be here to present this to you. So we're ready to go. Is there a way that we can change the picture? Okay. We're high there. Okay, cool. Okay, cool. All right, so what's the issue? And the issue is paper towels. Um, they're, they're kind of primitive for what they are. I mean, they're, 
it's just that a lot of times they get wasted. And I mean, that's kind of what your whole presentation is about, is all the waste that goes through these paper towels that we've had them for so long. And the cost, I mean, it wasn't until we looked up online about how much they are per roll and realized about how astronomically expensive they are, especially to supply a place like a high school where they go through versus roll after roll after roll. And it's hard to justify the cost when half of them end up in the toilets and sinks on the floor. And we actually have a slide going into that a little bit more in depth. And uh, why do we need to fix the problem? Um, the cost of paper towels all is moving going through budget deficits and stuff like that. And the last thing we need to do is be spending money on something that could be easily replaced and something that gets wasted more often than not. Um, let's spend our time cleaning up the bathrooms when there's more pressing matters other than cleaning up paper towels if somebody goes too lazy to throw in the trash can. Um, and a poop bathroom cleanliness, so there's not paper towels obviously all over the floor, and it's just a mess that doesn't look good for people coming into the high schools. Um, you guys want to go? Uh, okay, so these are just pictures of how one bathroom at Century looks like. We ended up going down, taking pictures, and that's what we got. Uh, sometimes, when you walk in the bathroom, you see paper towels on the floor, on the sinks, during those, and sometimes even on the ceilings. I don't know, that's impossible. <laughs> but you find them up there. And that's, and that's all because of uh, the waste, how people waste paper towels a century on a daily basis. This is on a, that was on a good day as well. Um, most of the time when I walk in the bathrooms, all of the sinks are filled up with water because it's clogged so much that it starts to fill up and pour out the sides. So to understand how much this is costing us, um, we did some math for paper towels. Um, so um, this year so far, uh, we purchased 27 cases of paper towels. And each one has six cases, um, six paper towels in each case. Uh, each roll is six or eight by 600. Um, to produce each of the paper towels, um, it takes two or three trees. Um, so we're not really thinking about here. Uh, we're thinking about saving the environment. Uh, with the, how much we're we are using is 3,726 trees. We cut down each year to keep our own using paper towels. Um, and this is only for our school, so this is not school district. So we asked our custodian about our waste and everything, and he said about half of them are wasted. So to understand that 1,863 trees are wasted um, just because people are really are using their paper towels. Alrighty, so if all the paper towels were laid out, they would reach from century to here 26 times. Um, if laid out from Portland, they would just stretch all the way to Tacoma, Washington. Uh, can they make it to space? Um, <laughs> yes, they can. Space so is a few miles above sea level. Um, it's debated, but generally that's where scientists agree. Uh, so this means that the paper towels can make it to space and back and have some left over. So, um, and you can make it 91% of the way to the International Space Station. <laughs> so, food for thought. Uh, and this is only Century High School paper towel usage. Again, you start adding in the other high schools like Hill High and Glencoe, and even the middle schools or elementary schools, you can kind of start to realize that it could definitely go a lot further than the International Space Station. Um, so possible solutions. Um, so the first thing we did was went on Google and typed in hand dryer, and the Dyson Airblade came up, obviously. It's the most expensive at $1,200 per unit. It's not something to sneeze at. However, it's the fastest, it's the highest quality, it's the quietest, it's kind of the, it's the top of the line. Um, not only that, it's the cleanliness. cleanliness. Um, it's also very energy efficient, whereas this hand dryer right here wastes more energy, which is also not as good for the environment. So if you want to think about the environment, Dyson Airblade is definitely the way to go. And then there's the conventional hand dryer, which are a lot cheaper per unit. Um, you can probably get about, I mean, almost four for the price of a Dyson. However, the studies have shown that the, the conventional hand dryers actually can increase germs on the hands because in the crevices of your hands there can still be water in there and then it makes it warm. So it makes it a lot better uh, place for germs to grow. Some of the, the monetary savings that we did were equal to the, the 
ecological savings as well. If you purchase Dyson Airblades and just put them in the uh, eight main bathrooms, two in each bathroom that we have at Century High School, it would cost a total of just under $20,000. Uh, conventional dryer would be under $10,000, which, which is awesome. It's a best, best deal for sure. The, both of these dryers that we found online have five-year warranty, so if anything was to go wrong with them, they would have last for at least five years. Over five years, uh, roughly $23,738 are spent on paper towels. So the savings over five years, even if you went with the top of the line model of the Dyson Airblade, you would still save just under $5,000. And uh, the conventional hand dryer would save over $15,000. So it's kind of a no-brainer when it comes to monetary value. And not to mention the 8,000 trees that will be saved in the process as well. And that's our presentation. Yeah, I was just going to put the same question. Yeah. First off, thank you guys. Really love this presentation. Um, you know, I actually previewed it to my wife a little bit. She goes, oh, she really loved the Dyson one. So, <laughs> um, just, but I did have a couple of questions for you about uh, your uh, beers. First off, uh, the prices you quoted, did, that didn't include installation, did it? No, it didn't. However, on the Dyson website, um, it did say that they could do like school installations. So they had like things where they installed them on like Soldier Field and like other schools where they sure. had some special deal. Like, hey, if you buy these handrails, we'll come install them. Right. Okay. And so the second thing that uh, I was thinking about was that you, know, you have a lot of kids who have to get through the bathrooms in a very short period of time, and that was the other reason why my wife happened to like the Dyson one because it seemed it was a lot faster than the other and a lot quieter too in the halls and everything. So. In my way of thinking that that was actually a better deal. Um, but I can't help but think that I still like paper towels, at least some, you know. Um, yeah, so that part's not even going cold turkey yet. I, I know it's on the fire. I get it. But I, I have a hard time with cold turkey yet. But I love the idea of putting in some of these kids into the school. So I'm, you know, I'm happy you brought it to our attention. Thank you very much. I personally enjoy drying my hands with paper towels better. It just seems more efficient, gets them more dry, but um, we weren't thinking about getting rid of absolutely all of the paper towels in the school. In the science labs and uh, teacher bathrooms where it's less traffic, it, it probably wouldn't match the, uh, the cost to savings ratio for those areas. No, and that was convenient. It's like if there's a spill in the classroom, obviously hand dryers aren't going to really help. <laughs> so it wouldn't be a complete phase out, but it definitely would be a substitute. Adriana had mentioned. No, I just think the 20 seconds we save on instruction time is worth the money. So that's think it's better because it's 12 seconds versus the 40 seconds. We need you back in the classroom. To <laughs> me. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I just want to say that your research is commendable. I mean, this is something, I work for a company that is um, the goal, and this is something that our company did as a study, cost savings, environmental, and everything else. So the, the research that you did and your presentation is something that a future employer will really appreciate when you bring that to them and say, you know, this is my proposal and this is why. So I think it's very impressive. Um, and um, is this a boy problem? Is this all boys on the back? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just called it that. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, I wanted to say because um, we have a green team where I work and we have this discussion and we have, we have the Dyson um, uh, air blowers, but we have folks that really don't want to get rid of that paper towel. So, um, I really do believe that we should get rid of the paper towels, and so I was wondering if I could borrow your presentation. Do you care if I take that to show what students are doing to show their example of? Yeah, I wanted to ask. I wanted to make we, sure before I. We'd be honored to have somebody who wants to. Come. I would love to. I would absolutely love to. So, and I know they'll appreciate it. Tomorrow, we're I'm heading to the 100 Best Green Companies. Uh, award for the company I work for, and you know, this is the kind of stuff they talk about at these events. So I applaud you. Okay, yeah, just two, two points I wanted to bring up. One, I just wanted to, to reinforce the point that we really need to keep paper towels in addition to these things. 
Um, just yesterday, I was at a location where there was a bathroom where there were no paper towels and just hand dryers. And as I stood there drawing my hands, I noticed like half a dozen people give up and just sort of wipe their hands on their shirt and walk out of the bathroom. And, and that I don't think would be good for the public health of our high schools. Um, That's other, what I other point I wanted to bring up was just it seems like your initial photos showed more than a a paper towel problem, it showed a behavior problem, right? I mean, when you see a paper towel on the ceiling, right, someone didn't accidentally drop their paper towel and have it go straight up, right? I mean, that's an act of intentional vandalism, you know, as are, I think, those other photos you showed. And I'm wondering if there's room here for sort of a behavior campaign, um, you know, to teach the other kids in your schools, and you've shown what are the financial consequences of all this wastage. Maybe you can freely tell them, hey, the reason why you don't have an updated Chromebook in your classroom is because we have to spend the money on paper towels instead to replace the ones on the ceiling. And, and there, I think there's room here for a behavioral campaign as sort of a companion to your, your dryer campaign. Conti? I was just going to say, the, the four guys, uh, and we know the women's bathroom was probably worse as <laughs> You guys probably didn't go in there, but he was yeah. probably <laughs> Thank you very yeah. much. So, yeah. so after after your presentation, we uh, Lauren and I met a little bit, and we talked about uh, putting, uh, we're going to do a trial at Century, and putting the uh, Dyson air balloons oh, in at Century. So, uh, oh. ever been applauded for resting <laughs> And, uh, and Lauren was talking to me about uh, the installation, and uh, what he was saying is that uh, when it comes to the installation, we have we have the crew that can only yeah. do that. So, so they're all ready to go on that. If I may uh, add one thing, about I don't know, two or three days after we saw that presentation, got a similar request from another high school. So <laughs> what you've done is getting around pretty fast. Yeah. <laughs> it, and then I guess the, the final thing I would say is that. Uh, I fear that there's going to be some kids selling paper towels out of the locker. <laughs> <laughs> but really, thank you. There are worse things to be selling out of the locker. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for bringing this to our attention. And, um, you guys will forever be known as the paper towel guys. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, um, the next student presentation, and guys, don't feel obligated to stay. You've done your good deed, uh, whatever, whatever works for you. Um, our second presentation, um, Ms. Sala is a student at uh, Jackson Elementary, and I met him about six weeks ago, and I met him because uh, the principal at Jackson, David Lee, kept writing about this guy. And he, uh, he kept saying that this, this guy is so smart, you've got to just meet him. And uh, he, had, uh, he had ideas about technology, he had ideas about um, the amount of time that our bus is idle and the, and the amount of money that we can save. Um, he had some ideas about nutrition. Evidently, he'd been snooping around in the storeroom of the kitchen. Um, and he had lots of ideas around technology. So um, I went over and met with him, and he laid out his presentation. And we had him back here last week. And um, we went over his presentation, and he also had the opportunity to go and visit the tech department and uh, see what the server room was all about. We, we didn't leave him by himself in there. Because, uh, <laughs> He's got lots of ideas. So, uh, Ms. Olive, come on up and uh, show us your presentation. Yeah, backwards. First, I'd like to thank um, Mr. Scott for this opportunity. Hello, my name is Asala, and I would like to talk to you about technology in the Hillsborough School District. Most kids in the district find the technology in the district undependable and slow, and I would like to speak to you about the problems with the technology we have and what we can do about it. Yeah. 
just have to wait for the technology. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. First of all, what is Hillnet? Hillnet is a collection of servers that runs every computer in the district. Whenever you are using a school or office computer, you are using Hillnet. If you have ever used a computer at one of the schools, then you know that logging in and doing different tasks is slow. You may think that this is mostly the computer's fault, considering that they're so old and big. <laughs> Most of the time, this is not true. To see whether the server or the computers were at fault, I tested the two computers you see on the screen by taking some of them completely off the Hillnet domain. So basically, they're just like your average home computer. I would then see which set of computers operated faster in common tasks, such as powering the computers on, logging in, using OAKS, and other common tasks that most kids do. Now, we all know that these computers are old. How old are they, you ask? <laughs> How old are they? I'm so glad you asked. <laughs> They're so old that they still work with Roman numerals. <laughs> now, we found the kid drawing of them. <laughs> These computers are so old that they have Doritos for computer chips. <laughs> when they boot, they have to tie their shoelaces. <laughs> principal told me I had to lighten it up. <laughs> but seriously, the results of my tests are extremely surprising. So these are the results I got. So these are in seconds. So what we have, so in the red, so the red is the Hillnet average, so that's the time that Hill, the Hillnet computers took. And then these are the completely off Hillnet computers. So as you can see, so there's a, there's a gigantic difference between the off Hillnet computers, time in seconds, and the uh, off the computer's time. So power on, log on, log out. So if logging on to the at JKS account for testing, opening Oaks, this is beneficial. And this was when no other computers in the entire school were using Oaks. So with more computers on Oaks, there would be a bigger load on Oaks. Mm -hmm. Signing into Oaks looks like the same, and shutdown is extremely low. So as you can see from that, the off the net computers are much faster than the on the net computers. So as you can see from the graph, it is mostly the outdated server-side networking of the Hillsborough School District technology that is causing problems. Oaks and many other beneficial school programs run off of the Hillsborough School District server, and important files are also stored. Because of the slow internet infrastructure and server, going to these websites and logging in can take over 15 minutes. Now I'm going to give you some real life applications of the things that we do in technology that are severely slowed down by the outdated server. The first is a program that I run called Quizlet. So at our school, I run a quizzing program called Quizlet, which is an online studying, spelling study tool that I run for our school. Because of the slowness of the internet and the slowness of logging in, going to these websites like Quizlet on the test subject computers from the previous slides is very hard. Because of this, students like me can't study as much at school. Now on a more important note, school is <coughs> Oaks testing. So just before I started testing computers, I was doing Oaks testing with our mobile laptops, the small ones, and the iPads. So in half an hour, half of the class was still waiting. Only four laptops were working, but all the iPads were working and taken. In an hour, 10 kids were still work and waiting, and five laptops started working. At the end of math class, three students still had not started their test. The Oaks application is stored on the Hillnet server, where it is run right off of the file directory. This shows that Hillnet and data retrieval from Hillnet is slow. The next day, the ODE said that the iPads couldn't be used anymore, so we had to wait for a long time until the computer lab was built to get faster technology. As you can see, all of these problems with slow logging in, slow internet, slow file retrieval, slow video and music streaming, and slow testing all originate from technology infrastructure, which is the backbone of the Hillsborough School District technology and the internet routers. It's important for the district to focus more money on technology infrastructure. Now you might be asking, based on the server test results, because the awful net computers are so much faster, why don't we just take all the computers off the net and use them individually? 
unfortunately, there are many um, problems that could happen. So I tried this at Jackson, and so even though none of these happened, what could have happened is that uh, students could have messed with the accounts and wireless connections, changed passwords, messed up systems, and deleted important files. Even though Google Drive could be set up to synchronize the files, it is still hard to have a synchronized, safe file system for the computers. Basically, we need a better server and wireless infrastructure. So the server on the screen is just an example of a, a new type of server for a better server room. So this is the type of server that would work better with the computers. So on the HP website, on the servers, there's, a, there's this entire guide for um, different districts for, um, for the uh, load on the computers and what, um, what, ser what, ser e what each server can handle. And so that could really help get a better server. So as you can see from this graph, more than, more than let's see, more than 40% of our computers are seven or more years old. More than 70% of our computers are more than four years old. Even though we do have a lot of old computers, as you saw from the graph, they have a potential to work really fast. As you, can, as you saw, it is beneficial that the district spends more money on technology infrastructure, such as servers and internet routers, the faster data retrieval, logging in, doing beneficial tasks, and accessing the internet. I know that you have already put aside $500,000 for technology infrastructure, but even this much money will not cover the expenses that are required for making the computer system in the district faster. So I urge you to put more money into this fund, and I hope that you take my Any questions? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you uh, very much. It was uh, a great presentation. You did a great job. And uh, you better watch out. So. <laughs> <laughs> and, and to be honest, just on, on, on a serious note, I kind of had some thoughts along that way, where that's why I'm always harping on the infrastructure, is because the, the internet pipe is so important for what we're doing. But, but, but I recognize what you're saying. I appreciate you bringing it up. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm on your side of the committee for, for where you're going, because what, uh, the computers really don't replace teaching. They are a great multiplier teacher effectiveness. And so, at least I'm committed, and I know that my fellow board members are, to uh, helping out as much as we can in this situation. I'm just so incredibly impressed with your presentation. Um, I, I really um, want to say that um, you need to be uh, on alert because you will be contacted for a future bond. <laughs> <laughs> would just love to see that and see your research and really understand because we have all these wonderful companies that invest in our district and when they can see your work and they can work you know and find out what what they can do to help they might say oh my gosh I think this student is on to something so I just thank you for, for your work and appreciate it this is excellent. Uh, we could have used you six months ago in the bond issues <laughs> for the public. You could have been our poster person. Uh, and uh, as Steve will uh, attest to, I love bar charts, and your bar charts are really great in the comparisons there. Keep up the good work. Thanks. I'll ask an actual question to you. So, how do you go about selecting? Uh, uh, what technology to test the laptops or the equipment that you used and decided to test? I just picked um, three random laptops from our laptop cart and, and um, three more that were on the net. And then um, I just tested them with time for times. And then I found the average and I put them on the board. Excellent, excellent presentation skills. I will pay that natural talent today. But this was great, very, very needed. We, we know like six months from now, a year from now, two years, you will be coming. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, this is really great. Um, I think the kind of benchmarking you're doing, um, what I'm wondering is why, why we needed you to do it. Um, is our IT department watching this and starting a regular program to repeat this benchmarking? It seems like something you should be doing you know, every six months or so to really understand what's happening to our network and our infrastructure. Yeah, Mike, do you have a comment on that? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, I think that 
Well, so we, we frown on students taking the computers off the offline in order to. <laughs> 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 this isn't a perfect system. Um, and uh, and Don, Don and I actually did meet with Masala, but this is worth we had a $25 million bond, $17 million of it for technology. So it is, it's fair to say that we're apprised of this problem. Okay, yeah, but I mean, I think in particular, this, this benchmarking result that he gave was nice and clear. You know, the results of changing the server. That seems like something that should be, that chart or some equivalent of it with fresh data should be up every time we're discussing technology. And, but this seems to be the first time we've seen that. So I think that it's very, you've done a good service to the district in sort of spotting this problem, pinpointing it, and really doing the, the first step of the benchmarking. But I think there's room for a lot more, a lot more of that, a lot more systematically, right? And we can really understand quantitatively exactly what we're losing when we don't upgrade our servers, when we don't upgrade our clients, right? And also the, the really important question I think we started asking here is, you know, where's the, where's the big bang for the buck, right? Do we get more money? upgrading our clients, our servers, both. Uh, we, we really need to understand that. It seems like what you show, it seems like you know, all the conversations I've had when I've gone into classrooms and teachers have said, oh, we need better computers. Yeah, that's what you we know. always say. But with this, when I took them off on that, they're so much faster. Right, yeah. So, so a lot of times when teachers say they need better computers, the teacher doesn't understand that the computer in their classroom, even though it looks ugly because it's old, isn't the real problem. Right, and uh, so you know, maybe that we'll do an analysis and decide. You know what? The district's optimal spending is to buy 2,001 computers that are really cheap for everybody in the district, but spend you know a billion dollars to create the ultimate computer network of Hillnet. You know, and it's you know, I think there's a balance there, and this type of benchmarking is really important for that. So yeah, so I think this is this is really great. So thanks. Thanks, Nisala. I love because I had um, visited your math class and your teacher, and you guys all stood up and told me how long your math, how many of you finished your math test. So it was great to see a presentation for other people to understand that. Because it's one thing to go in a classroom and hear one kid say, oh, wait, Miss Kim, I waited for the whole hour and I never got on the Oaks test. But for you to share it in this way with really good data is a great way for our community to understand what that looks like. Because so many people don't have kids who come home and share those stories with them. So I really appreciate you taking the time to help share that story. Thanks. So uh, just a couple things. Look, we do have five hundred thousand dollars set aside for the infrastructure, and part of that is um, the access, of course. Um, Don is well versed on all of these issues and has had great conversations with us all. Um, know that uh, there's more to the story than this presentation. <laughs> all right, um, we'll leave it at that because I don't want to detract from the great job that you did. Um, the the uh, just the knowledge that you have around this is absolutely amazing. I, I love meeting with you in the principal's office over at Jackson and meeting them to, to come over and, uh, and take the tour. Absolutely love that. And you have a great future ahead of you. And when, you uh, when you head off to Evergreen, in fact, I'm going to warn Mr. Peter <laughs> 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 And, uh, and the, other, the other thing is he's got, this all got some great ideas and we had a good conversation on transportation and many other issues. So, um, great job. We did a super job tonight. So, keep up the great work.
our wonderful students, but How long also, did you your point? That was <laughs> <laughs> also just incredibly thrilled that we have students like the group from Century and the Solace who um, overwhelm us with how they're thriving in our schools. Uh, so, hello, I'm, Hills I'm Laura Beckham, um, board president of the Hillsborough Schools Foundation. I'm here to just give you our annual update. Happy to be here again. Uh, and I guess I would say that we have been engaged in a year of change. Uh, we started out by creating a new mission and vision to cultivate community engagement and funding to inspire excellence in our Hillsborough schools and to bring the community together to enhance public education for every student in the Hillsborough area. And we love the emphasis on bringing the entire community together to benefit our students. Uh, we've been working on ongoing strategic planning and we're excited for growth this year. So I brought these, a few pictures to tell you what's been keeping us busy. Our number one huge uh, event every year uh, is our auction and gala that happened on March 8th. Um, we set some records this year. We have a record number of sponsors from our wonderful business community. Uh, we raised $146,000. We sold 296 tickets out of a possible 300. And we were so gratified to see some of our board members, our wonderful staff, not only attending, but volunteering to help make the event happen. Um, and so thank you for your support on that. <laughs> then there was in April, we take four nights where we take over the admin center. Uh, and our high school clubs come in to do a terrific job on the phone -thon. Of course, the highlight was calling from Superintendent Scott's desk. Uh, uh, the students had fun with that. Um, and this year, we contacted over 13,000 households to tell them more about our foundation and to ask for their support. We had 277 students come in and make calls and we raised over $35,000. You know, since we started doing this in 2003, we have given away almost $125,000 to our clubs. We are always engaged in outreach. That's a full-time job. Um, we like to be wherever we can get to know more people and they can get to know us. So we're at the Celebrate Hillsboro, we're at the Kinder Fair, and we are so happy to have such a wonderful relationship with our chamber as they help support us through the Crystal Apple Awards. You know, every year we're adding more business partners, too. Uh, a couple of the notables this year were Mod Pizza, who donated their proceeds on their opening night of uh, $1,700, and we had a lot of fun in their photo booth. Um, and then we also just brought on Yozo. So what we've done as part of this strategic reorganization is divided our board into four action teams. We have a marketing action team, and this group has been, uh, no, it's not led by, uh, oh, Steve's not there. Took Steve off. <laughs> All right. Um, we have a marketing team, and we have hired a public relations firm to cre help us create marketing and communication action points and bullets. They also helped us assess the need for maybe a name change, which we did not do, and we're developing a new logo and new materials. Um, we're, we're looking, we're very soon to add some office hours to actually push our marketing initiative forward. 
So we're very excited about that. We, of course, have uh, our, our, the reason we exist is to be able to give money away. And so how we fund is one of our teams who look, has been looking at um, the way we support the, our students and our district through funding and they've been asking some questions of our community through an online survey to see what they think we should fund and we've also been contacting other foundations to see what they do in collaboration with their district to um, support their students to achieve. And I just want to point out to you that in our existence, we have now given away over one million dollars to our um, school district, our, or our schools, our schools and our students, and we're just thrilled about that. Of course, we can't give money away unless we raise it, and so we do have a fundraising team as well. You know, our solid rock. Uh, events, our, our auction and our comathon, but we are looking for, always looking for other ways. Um, we're looking for to develop a family friendly fall event. Um, some possibilities going on about that. We're always working on more outreach to our business community. And we're working on thinking about ways to help our supporters see possible ways that they could support us maybe through bequests or an endowment campaign. That's our fundraising team looking at that. And of course, we're always happy when we get some nice press. And this year, we had a sort of surprise grant from First Tech at the end of the year. And so we were able to uh, put some technology money into uh, our two schools, uh, Jackson and Eastwood. Eastwood. Yeah, it was great. Um, and then our last group, of course, is our ongoing strategic planning group. We have to keep thinking about how to create a dynamic board, how to develop, how to grow. And one of the things that we've really um, moved forward with this year and that we're very excited about is that we're working more closely with Mike and his administrative team to allow us to look at ways we can collaborate and help one another thrive. So last, I would like to just say that we're looking for the next big thing. We really do want to grow. We want to double our giving. Um, and so we love your ideas. We need your support. We need your ideas. We need you to talk to, to others in our community about us. And um, let us know what we can do to help our district and our students. So thanks. I just wanted to comment. I, I just so appreciate um, the partnership that you um, provide and the support that you provide for the district is incredible. And um, I think that it was exciting today just to be part of that surprise prize patrol to be able to see those winners. One of them was right here that, that, it, that I was able to, to see it at Lincoln Street and um, we'll, I'm sure we'll hear about that in a little bit too. But um, and, and I missed by one minute City View um, received theirs and they were really excited as Kim was saying is you know that it was like a tearful victory mom. Yeah because um, this opportunity was given to them and so the, the amount of support that you give for our schools and our staff, our staff that work so hard to put these presentations, uh, grants together and just hope that their idea, you know, is something that, that is a winning uh, prize patrol moment um, is just fantastic. So thank you so much because it's above and beyond the education that we can provide and it certainly is, you know, a very giving partnership and we appreciate it. Well, thanks. We, we love doing what we do. And I know, I know this thing, I know we haven't announced all the grants, um, but as the request um, 
it's bigger. It's the need is bigger. I love that that um, you're taking on the challenge of how can we double what we're doing, knowing that they can't just be two thousand dollar grant anymore. That to meet the needs of um, those requests, those grant values are growing. And so I love that rather than just saying sorry, what we've got is two thousand dollars that you're. You're thinking about your strategic plan and thinking about how are we going to rework this, how are we going to earn more, how are we going to involve more community members. Um, and I just appreciate that. And you always make your volunteer opportunities fun. They don't feel like work. They're not like most volunteer opportunities. They're lots of fun, and especially by the way you involve students. Um, the phone call this year was a total blast. And, um, <laughs> students being able to sit in the superintendent's office was the highlight for some of my students. <laughs> Volunteer, so. mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Thank you for making so much fun. Yeah. Anyone else? Yeah, I just want to say thank you. Amazing how much it's grown and to see it evolve and all those numbers. And I'm, I'm so excited about hanging out with Mike and become more in aligning. And I think that's awesome. The new direction. And I can't wait to see the unveiling of the fresh new marketing again. Mm -hmm. Excited. Just the numbers are amazing. I mean, they're all for our kids, yeah. for our community. Yeah, that's what we hope. And I just want to also say we have 20 hardworking board members and many, many volunteers beside that. And uh, two of our other board members are there. At, oh, who am I missing? Oh, three of our other board members are there. Uh, you guys want to stand up? Yes, please stand up. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. I just had one, I mean, to give over a million dollars is something, yeah. but a lot of times that those grants are seed money for getting something yeah. bigger started, yes. so, yeah. so it's just a multiplication, yeah. and uh, it's great. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Yeah. I have to add, because, you know, we talk about that, and you look at on, the, on some of those... Um, those awards that are given for the grants, and it's exciting to be able to say that First Tech, you know, and the companies that are ma making those extra grants possible is is exciting. And when you looked at 124, 26,000 that you've given to high school groups, I mean, those of us that have high school students know how these students, how hard they work on these fundraisers. And not only is it a fun fundraiser, but they, this is significant cash for their program. So thank you very much. Very significant. Can I just say that uh, we don't have many partners quite like the Hillsborough Schools Foundation to, to give a million dollars over the years and to ask nothing in return. They, they give this money because um, that's what motivates them, that's what excites them. Um, not only are they dedicated, they're committed, and they're just incredibly hardworking, but they're a fun group of people to hang out with. And uh, the, the grants that they provided our students and the enrichment opportunities that we haven't been able to fund over the last several years, and uh, just the learning experience that you provided. Just thank you so much on behalf of our students. We really value your partnership and look forward to many great things to come. So thank you. Get <laughs> Miss Sala, if you want to go, we understand. You don't have don't look at yesterday and watch the whole thing. You can if you want to, but you won't hurt my feelings if you don't. Um, we're going to go through a series of first readings. And remember, when we do first readings, um, we can ask some clarifying questions here, but you also have an opportunity to ask um, questions offline as well, since there is quite a few of them. And they'll be back for a final approval in a month. And the first one this evening is going to be a high school course proposal. Travis, come on up. I didn't mean to imply you were going to be boring after you have those presentations. No, the fun presentations have only just begun. <laughs> we're kidding, we're kidding. We have the I, You know, I, you are correct. Course proposals are exciting. So while our team's coming up front, it's an honor for me to uh, offer a first reading tonight of a new high school course proposal called Simply Mariachi. Um, Mr. Bosart um, is here tonight to talk a little bit about the course and he's brought some students who are currently in the Hillsborough Mariachi Band called Una Voz, which means one voice. 
Um, it's currently a club activity, and with the sponsorship of Hillsborough High School, Mr. Bosart is um, recommending a new course. Also with me tonight is Lisa Allen, who is the chair of our Citizens Curriculum Advisory Committee. So um, Lisa's going to talk a little bit about the presentation that happened on May 5th to the Citizens Curriculum Committee, offer their recommendation regarding this course, and then introduce Mr. Bosart and students uh, to describe a little bit uh, about the course and then answer any questions that the board might have. So. <laughs> Good evening. Uh, so I'll just give you a brief rundown of what happened in our meeting um, last month, and then I'll turn it over to Mr. Uh, and he's here. So um, as Travis said, we got a presentation, and we heard from Mr. Bozart as well as uh, several students. Uh, volunteer who's actually a professional mariachi who helps out with the club, and also um, a parent came. So we got a lot of different perspectives about this. So. <clears throat> The committee recommended unanimously that you all um, decide to approve the course. Um, and some of the things that excited us most about this is just being able to expand the arts department at the high school level, and especially with the music, um, and also offering more diverse band experience for students so that maybe we can engage students on a more cultural level um, and get them more invested and engaged in the high school experience. So we were really excited about those things and also hearing some personal stories from the students about what it meant to them and hearing some stories about how it helped them out their subjects, things like that. So as a committee, we were really excited and hope that you are too. So if you have questions later about kind of what our discussion was, I can answer those later. So you take it away. Um, so yeah, my name is Dan Bosart, and I'm just, I could talk for hours about this group and what, what mariachi has meant to me and, and to these students and to my teaching. So basically I see an amazing opportunity. I'm a music teacher, uh, and this is a great opportunity for us to involve more students in music education, uh, to increase the rigor and the academic standards that we have for, for uh, music education, to involve more students, to create more connections. Um, it's, the, it's been the type of experience where volunteers are finding me. Uh, parents are calling me to see how they can help. Um, things mysteriously get done that I didn't ask to get done because everyone wants this to, to be as good as it possibly can be. Um, I feel valued by my students. I feel valued by the families that I work with. And our students feel, feel valued by the community. Uh, when we get invited to play a Trailblazers game, that means a lot. Uh, when we, we get invited to play at La Pulga at the, uh, the flea market, that means a lot to us. When uh, the library, when they finish their second floor, they invite us to be a part of the opening, um, that, that makes us feel great. And we know that our work, the work that we're doing is uh, rewarding in the, in the rehearsal room. Uh, we work pretty hard, um, we have fun performing, um, but we feel like we're doing good work and our work is, is rewarding for us, rewarding for the community. And this is a great opportunity to create, to create more connections. Uh, it's involved more students in music education and, and with the schools. Um, so here with me today, I'll go from left to right, we have Jose, we have Victoria, Maricela, and Hanaro. Um, and they've been um, solid students, uh, just wonderful to, to work with, and they will be happy to answer any questions that you have, uh, as well as myself. Um, so we open this up to questions. Yep, so any questions? Awesome. So it's quite fun. Well, more of a comment. Than <coughs> First off, I read the proposal, and I absolutely love it. Um, I think this will make a great, as we all put it in, but I, I think it'll make a great uh, addition to the performing arts. Um, my usual soapbox is that music is so important for kids for the whole development, and it is so true. It's not just you guys, but in, in all of our music programs, the kids who are in these programs tend to have such better involvement in school, uh, engagement, grades, they're just outstanding citizens, and a lot of it is just just the, the process of, of learning to play an instrument, much like being in you know, a, a sport team or whatever, uh, has just so many side benefits that cognitive function. So this is a fantastic idea, and I welcome it. I'm just thrilled for you guys to the proposal. And I, I love that comment, and just to piggyback off that. I mean, there's some students I get to work with where grandpa played clarinet, mom was in the band, and it's just obvious that this is gonna work, and this is gonna be a part of this student's future. 
with this group I've had a chance to connect with students where it didn't they didn't have the feeling like they were going to be connected with any musical group in our schools but uh, I've been able to reach them a counselor that I work with says you know thank goodness and he gave a couple names thank goodness these two guys have mariachi because I don't see how they're gonna you know how they're gonna fit um, in other ways so I want more teachers to have the experience that I'm having um, more students to have that opportunity thank you well, I first want to just with tremendous gratitude thank you for bringing us and, and being the driver. I know what these programs and how they they not only, um, I can't even think of the word for our, for our students, not only our, our Latino students, but also the community as well. I think what you just said right now is you don't want to deny another teacher the experience that you're having. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think that is so powerful because I have seen these kiddos from when you first started all the way to where they are. You know, I think sometimes people start to look or they start thinking, oh my gosh, we have so many fears embedded, you know, into change and things and things that are different and taste different and feel different, you know? But there's so many things that bind us with this music. When you look at the history, the indigenous roots, along with the brass instruments that were brought in when, you know, the West are the same with folklorico. I mean, I remember being a kid and, you know, folklorico dancing to me was no different than my neighbors who square danced, you know, and, the, and I didn't know it all originally for polkas and something we don't share. And yet we're finding these avenues to pinpoint the differences and the divisiveness, which I value differences and I love differences, um, but at the same time we're so connected. And this, I mean, to me, what you just said right now is so powerful. You don't want to deny another teacher. And at that, at that same time, not another teacher, but another board. Thank you, thank you for bringing that, you know, and pushing the charge and 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 you know raising. I know these, there none of these kids are going to tell me that this hasn't impacted their academic mm -hmm. or even their personal life, self confidence. Maybe this is the place where you just felt like you could be you, you know, and, and all day being at school. But you know, when you got together, like hey. So just, I mean, I'm just curious, questions, I mean, how, how do you feel your, you know, your playing has improved since, when you, you guys have been in it since the beginning, and these are your veterans. Yeah, so my name is Mara, like I was introduced, I play the trumpet, and basically the trumpet is a language that I'm able to communicate myself through, and be able to express my feelings and my emotions. So when I'm going to school and I'm doing the IV program, you know, I'm having a stressful day, I'm tired, I'm, I'm mad or I'm happy, I get to go and pick up my trumpet and just express my feelings. I get to be able to express myself and play this wonderful music and make people happy and create new opportunities for new students. I, uh, I had my friend, he's not with me. Uh, he didn't know how to pick up the trumpet, but I saw that he was motivated to try. So I had the opportunity to teach new students and you know, be an example for younger generations to you know, have, have someone to look up to and show them that they could to play the trumpet and learn the traditional Mexican music, which I love, and I like teaching people. I like showing people that I can do it and they could too, and that I have fun doing it. I mean, it's a fun for expressing myself, and I, that's why I love being here. I mean, I was for two years doing the high school band, but I couldn't just fit in with them. I didn't. I felt like I didn't belong there, and I still love music, so I was thankful for being able to uh, participate in Mariachi and still follow my music. Uh, Hungry, hungry, hungry. I can So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then like, yeah, can we all share? Hi, my name is Maricela Marquez. I'm an alto sax player uh, at the Hillsboro High School concert band, jazz band, and soon to be symphonic band, um, marching band, and fat band. I'm a violinist uh, or mariachi band. I've been playing sax since the sixth grade, and it's usually a sit-down band where I sit down with a session, just play play uh, gigs, do concerts, and uh, the audience claps. While in the mariachi band, I uh, we're standing up, we're all one voice, we're all expressing our feelings. And in my personal opinion, while I play that violin. I do it with so much joy because I know I'm connecting with the public and the public's feeling my emotions and I'm feeling theirs. 
So we make a really strong connection, and it makes our band um, play with so much energy, and we all sound really strong. Hi, I'm Victoria Vasquez, and I've been a member of the Manecio Novos. I play violin in this amazing band, and I've been playing violin since third or fourth grade, and I started out with just classical music and just strict classical. I am in the Metropolitan Youth Symphony, and it is really fun. But like Money Settler said, it is a sit-down thing where you sit down, and you look at the music, and you follow the conductor strictly, and that's all you do. However, in the mariachi, you get to stand up, and you get to have fun solos, and it is really fun. Also, my family is from, well, my mom is from Guadalajara, which is the birthplace of mariachi music, so I've grown up all my life with mariachi music, and it is so much fun to be a part of it now as well. Um, like Mr. Boulder said, as everyone guess, I play the bass guitar with Guru Moranchi, and for me, Moranchi is just a group. It's a family. We take differences and put them away and show how uh, all of us are friendly. You know, we connect with each other and we connect with the instruments and the crowd. Mm -hmm. I'm still waiting for El Mariachi Loco. Uh, we're working on it. Okay. We're trying to still waiting so, for that. Yeah. Okay. Almost. It's almost yeah. there. Yeah. One more week. Okay. Okay. Um, I'm a music lover too. I've uh, been uh, playing music all my life and enjoying it in all kinds of uh, forms, and my family uh, loves it. So I have a strong support of the music program and, and great classes. I had a couple of practical questions. I don't know who was the one that best respond uh, to it uh, regarding. Uh, first, is the proposal specifically for starting one class? This is a coursework proposal, but it's. <coughs> It's targeted at, the, at one high school. So regardless of, of the outcome of this course proposal and the, the staffing of this course at a high school, the, the Uno Los group and the, the club will still continue. So these guys will still play in their band. The proposal here is to um, offer this at any high school that wants to. Um, once it's approved for Hill High, other high schools will be able to start a mariachi class as well. Um, right now, Arturo Lomeli, the principal at Hill High, is putting together a plan to try to staff uh, the FTE and support this as a course offering next year. But if he doesn't have the resources to do it, it would be on the books so that he could do it in the following year. So it depends on the enrollment and money. Is any other elective or trade offs they make on the number of enrollees uh, to justify the, the FTE? Uh, uh, is it is it doable in high school? Is there something special here that enables uh, one of those to, uh, to, uh, to function that can be replicated? Or is there a belief that it is replicatable? Or is it a one, one point? Yeah, I think if, if I could talk to that, I mean, one of the one of my inspirations is Wenatchee High School in Washington, uh, where they have over 250 students involved in mariachi education. Um, they're sending first generation um, students, you know, first generation, first in their family to go to college, uh, building up a strong scholarship fund, showing pictures of their college graduates who were in, um, who were in mariachi. So there are many other schools that are, are finding the advantages of having a, a mariachi program in their, uh, in their, in their district. Uh, in terms of whether Hill High is a magical place, I mean, it's awesome. And it's an IV school, and it's dual language, and Mr. Lomeli has been a supporter of the group for a long time. So that's kind of the natural place um, to begin. Um, however, my students at Lincoln Street are all headed through Evergreen to Glencoe, and there's you know, a strong um, interest there. Um, also, when we did a, a sign up at Century during the club rush, we had over 30 students sign up to, to be in the group until they realized, wait, it's not at Century, that it was that there. It would involve some, um, some extra uh, transportation and, and extra time. So uh, it, it feels like you know, this opportunity is, is one that, that could be replicated in, in more than one place. And the last related question is, so just looking at the proposal costs and things, uh, for funding, uh, 
how does how does that typically work for uh, the covering funding costs? I mean, there's an FTE cost to support the, the alignment, but then there's the the actual cost of the course. Right, so we, um, the staffing would come from the school's budget. The instruments would either would come from a mixture of those funds that we spend on the supporting elective courses, um, and or in the case of the mariachi group, which is an actual gigging band, um, they do have their own source of, of revenue and to support their own um, uh, instruments and supplies. So. I asked because I, we talked about all the, the student groups that work really hard at fundraising to support it. I know that the, the bands themselves receive, uh, the high schools receive, correct me if I'm wrong, but they receive very little uh, uh, direct funding besides the FTE. Uh, my understanding is the, the fundraising uh, groups associated with the bands uh, pay for the music, pay for uniforms, instruments, repairs, uh, uh, out of that budget. Uh, is, that, is that the same kind yeah. of uh, effort you foresee? Some funds are self-funded. Uh, uh, not self-funded because music education is... Outside the, the FTE. Right, outside the FTE. I mean, music education is the goal here, so I don't want this... I mean, we have been kind of focused on performances and being prepared for concerts, but the goal is to, to involve more students in education, which which you know is at a very beginning level, and um, not to be gig oriented or realize, well, we got to put on so many shows or make X hundred dollars um, at each performance. Not to be in that professional musician mentality. Um, but on the other side, you know, this is the type of group where Central Cultural is happy to have us come, you know, two three times a year to promote their events and, and support our, our group. Um, you know, people are recognized. This is you know you're providing a service, and we're happy to support through donations. Um, you know your your group. So I wouldn't want to depend on you know performance revenue, but although that is a nice you know side uh, you know thing that does happen with with a group that that is welcomed by the community to perform. The other thing, if I can throw in there about FTE, is um, from the very beginning, I have been very adamant that this should not be, it should not draw away from the FTE of existing arts programs in the schools, that uh, we're at an, a point where we can expand and offer more. Um, so in my opinion, this, this proposal fails if it takes any money away from uh, a band or a choir class or a music theory class or a guitar class. Um, so that's that's been my, um, you know, my understanding and what I, I want other people to understand is, um, you know, this is an expansion of the arts and music electives. Uh, this is not re, you know, re-juggling the, uh, the ball. Resources. That's the word. Yeah. I just want to say that Dan's also been really careful about following the protocols, addressing this with the site council and the arts department at Hill High and their support before coming forward to the citizens. So, um, just so you know, normally this proposal would be a 30-day review, but um, being that our next board meeting would be on June 10th, it's something more like a 13-day review. So I just wanted to highlight that for the board and see if there are any uh, questions or that poses a difficulty for the process. My, my comment was just going to be, I, I have to say, this whole evening has been incredibly impressive and exciting as just for us to be able to see these students um, give these presentations. And obviously, by what the students are saying, that this um, that this has made, meant more to them than just playing an instrument. There's a lot of life lessons that are happening. And I think that as a district, when we can combine that, those type of um, those types of classes and electives, and we can combine that with our core classes, it can only mean great things because you're engaging students at a level of they're excited about being in school. And so um, I just, I'm just really impressed and I'm listening just even to the whole process with, with the citizens curriculum and, and the discussions you're having there and your involvement at that level and then taking it um, even to this, I just, I just thank you, thank you for, it's exciting to be in a time where we're actually considering looking at adding back classes and adding new classes because it's been a long time, baby. <laughs> and so this is, this is, um, this is wonderful, so thank you. Thank you. And yeah, just echoing everyone else, I really, um, it's exciting to see the growth of this group and um, uh, very supportive. And um, thank you, students, so much for coming and sharing. Your words are very, very powerful. And, and they're why many of us volunteer um, and we're working in education. 
and sticks get the kind of impact that you're talking about. And so your words really meant a lot. And I really think it's kind of hey. So Dan, how many how many students now? Uh, uh, 24. I remember your first presentation to the board. Yeah. Ah. And compared a little bit painful back then. No. Uh, <laughs> compare it to now, it is absolutely amazing the way you sound. I could not be more proud of the students standing here and the, the manner in which you were able to articulate your feelings and talk about what this has meant to you. And and Dan, I know this is your you're the driver behind this and uh, just the amount of time that you've dedicated to this over the years and I mean just purely you holding the law and making sure that we have these opportunities for our students. Um, just couldn't be more appreciated. So thank you for all the work. Impressive. Yeah. Today he receives grant money by HSF for his for his efforts and doing to expand himself. Go play at the auction. Awesome. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you very much. Yeah. We applauded a first reading. <laughs> um, so, board members, there's a second first reading tonight for high school course proposal. We originally had planned for the very end of the agenda because the teacher and the students had another event they were coming from. They have arrived from that event. And so, um, I would like to make a motion that item K is the first reading for the high school course proposal community service learning elective that we move it up right now. Um, and insert it between item D and E. So I want so to move. Thank you. Any questions about that? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Perfect. Motion carries. And with that, I'd like to add the Trevs just walk out the door. Because he didn't know I was going to do that. <laughs> um, we'll invite Travis and Work Nova to come up and share um, another course proposal. Brooke and her students have just come from Senior Honors Night yeah. at Lungo High School. Excellent. Yeah, go for one time to attend that. There you go. Sorry, Travis, I didn't tell you I was going to. I'm so sorry. Yeah. Okay. We've got this all set up for you guys. Excuse us for being tired. Um, Please take the time. I'm here with a second proposal for a first reading. Um, this one comes from Glencoe High School and Miss Nova. Um, this will be the first reading of a course titled, let me get this right, Community Service Learning Elective. So I'm here again with Lisa Allen, the chair of our Citizens Curriculum Advisory Committee, um, to introduce um, uh, Ms. Nova and some students who have just come from the event. Thank you for hurrying over here. <laughs> we had a busy evening, so I'll just turn it over to Lisa. Well, yeah. A quick side note, last time um, I met Ms. Nova was at our, our CCAC meeting and she was um, on her way to get with Mr. Glencoe mm -hmm. and so she was in like a very fancy dress. So at the time she was in a fancy attire, costume for an event. She was an MC. I guess. She wasn't a contestant. No. <laughs> 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 We're here to talk about the proposed course, which is a community service learning elective. Um, and the curriculum committee uh, voted seven to one um, that you all um, approve this course as a course offering. And just um, so you know, the dissenting vote wasn't a, a disagreement with the course proposal, but um, the person on the committee wanted a little bit more time to review the materials. Uh, so, that, so that person decided to vote and as a name, but not necessarily because they didn't believe in what was happening in the course. And we since adjusted our process for that's the first course proposal that we have had, so now we send out materials a lot further in advance for people's groups, which is that little such our apologies. <laughs> so just to give you an idea of what the committee liked about um, Ms. Nova's proposal, we heard from her several students and also a person that she works with at the city to get students um, service opportunities. And I think what stood out to, to several of us the most is offering the community service learning objective as a separate credit than the career, career experience, work, work, the work experience credit would allow students who like work after school, for example, to still serve in the community and have it be differentiated 
it, it gives more equitable, equitable access to our students. That's what a lot of us really liked about that. Um, and also, we feel that it makes our students a little bit more competitive when they're applying to colleges, so we don't just have a work experience, but they also, it reflects the actual community services as opposed to a work experience, because they are different things. So we're really excited about this, and um, basically students are already doing this. They're choosing to not get work experience, but to instead serve our community, and so we're excited to be able to applaud that and name it in what it is. I mean, that's okay. <laughs> All right. Well, good evening, everyone. I'm so happy to be here. We did have a wonderful honors night, and and as you can tell, the girls made off with quite a few boards and regalia, so that was that was great. Um, we have piloted the community service elective credit all this year. So these two students have been going to local elementary schools through a program called Blast, and it's a pass no pass elective credit that we embed into their schedule so allows them the opportunity to go during the school day and as um, the chair spoke about it also allows students who either work or have to go home and help their families or are involved in sports or extracurricular activities the opportunity to serve in our community that's embedded in their school day um, I'm going to pass the mic over to our students because they're going to speak a little bit about their experience and then we'll share a little bit more about it. Hello, uh, my name is Lena and I'm of course my seniors. Um, I started BLAST Experience Program my second semester of this school year and it has been um, an amazing experience. It has opened a lot of opportunities for me to work with the community um, in a closer way, especially I love kids, and this program has allowed me to connect with the kids and the community and their parents in a more personal level, and that's the most amazing and valuable thing that I've ever um, been able to experience with the community. But also the program has offered me to uh, apply for scholarships and put that in my scholarship and experience that I have with the kids and, and um, different levels and also um, the program has offered me a job next year with the Hillsborough Parks and Rec and which is an amazing um, and but after this program I, I've always you know I, I'm looking forward more to volunteer at more uh, events this summer with kids like summer camp and it has opened a lot of opportunities for me and opened up my eyes with uh, what it really feels like to work with community and you know, in this close road town and it's just an amazing experience so far for me and and with my peers and I also I, I, I work with the class at um, Patterson Elementary School and uh, yeah and I have a great um, like their workers like Trish and um, Jono and Haley and they're my friends now, we call each other, but it's, it's an amazing experience and I'm very thankful that I uh, was able to join in and thank you to Ms. Nova and Christy often had given me that, um, this opportunity to work with the program. So, yeah. Uh, good evening, my name is Diane Flores, and um, I have had, I've heard through this program of class through my CAM class, uh, Child Services class, which I have been taking since my freshman year. Uh, I went to this blast program um, my second semester of high school and it was definitely a changing experience. It reassured me that I did want to work with children but and they offered me a job to go with them uh, next year and over the summer um, but unfortunately um, I can't take it. I'm going to go off to college so um, but I am going to pursue the child um, working with children in the future because this program did inspire me to work more in depth with all sorts of children at all ages. And um, I have been working with kids. You do get attached to them. You do learn a lot from them. Um, it is definitely a growing experience. I did put all this you know, um, information in like to applications, scholarship applications, and all the things that I do need to succeed in life. And it did teach me a lot. Um, and I do appreciate this opportunity to Ms. Nova. And I really hope that there are more students out there that could take this opportunity to work with more children out there. Thank you. 
So something to know is that we use BLAST as the pilot model, but we definitely can infuse other community service uh, learning opportunities provided by our Gilbert community and use those experiences to embed community service elective credit with our students. But we just saw this as an easy pilot model that aligned with BLAST. Something else that why we chose BLAST was because students were able to, to either drive or walk to their sites and I really wanted to make sure that that was an equitable experience that our students either had the ability to walk to Patterson, which is behind Glencoe, or to go to Free Orchard or to Lincoln Street Elementary School. But I want to make it clear that we can definitely infuse other community service learning opportunities that are aligned to other pathways. This is just the pilot for this program. Something else I want to make a note of as well is this really aligns with our strategic plan. Um, if, you, if you look at the 2011-16 strategic plan under two of the uh, alignments, it's in engagement and, and in equity. Um, in engagement, it says to increase the number of opportunities at both the district and community to promote meaningful engagement, volunteerism, and participation. And then under equity, to refine and recruit uh, retention to support all students. So this pilot model really has aligned with both of those strategic plan um, strands. We're going to show you a video about BLAST and to, and to show you a little bit about what the program has done for the elementary students. And then Christy's going to speak a little bit about how we can use this course in our, in our community later on down the road. Take it away, technology. <laughs> You're on.
purpose for this is to make sure that we can use that as a district. I know that counselors are very excited to be using this in different ways to embed in, in student schedules. So even though I'm proposing this um, and, and pilot at Glencoe, I definitely foresee it being used in our district. Christy is going to talk a little bit about the community aspect piece. And then I'm going to, it's not in your packet, but I brought uh, the transportation release forms that we used and also for uh, scheduling the attendance part as well. I wanted you guys to know that I wasn't just sending students out willy-nilly. That might have been a concern, I don't know. So I brought the documentation of what we used and I will pass that out to you after Christy speaks. Hello, uh, my name is Christy Wilson and I work with the City of Hillsboro. Um, I currently work in the Human Resources Department, but um, that's, that's very new. I've only been there for a couple weeks. Prior to that, for about eight years, I was the volunteer coordinator for Hillsboro Parks and Rec. And the very interesting thing about this program is Brooke and I started working together around when I started eight years ago. And for about probably five years, it was um, our BLAST program continued to grow, but it was so hard to find volunteers to help out with the, prob the program from two to five. Because either you're working or the you know kids are in school or whatever. But So we tried to do some um, foster some partnerships with colleges or trying to figure out what can we do. We'll go into the senior center, trying to recruit volunteers that that were retired to help out. And um, and then just discussing, Brooke and I, um, Brooke came to me with this idea, and um, it has worked out so great. I know um, the city staff, it's just been a breath of fresh air as the class sizes continue to grow. All these students provide a just fresh energy and new ideas and support um, to help some kids that are maybe a little behind on homework time get caught up before they get picked up at five and, and just do great things. And um, now that I'm at the Civic Center working with other city departments, I've had conversations just in passing with fire department and other departments in the city that, that have been using, um, I think it was Liberty High School students teaching hands-only CPR to um, middle school students and just different different ways where you just start thinking of all the ways that, that um, youth could, could volunteer during their school day and get some valuable community service, um, work experience, and explore different careers um, and then still be able to play sports and do after school things. So um, as, a, as a community partner, I think that the city at least really benefits from, from this opportunity. So I just want to thank Christy Wilson and Brooke Nova both for being key players and thinking outside the box and trying to figure out how to get kids more experiences that are career related and also for credit. So again, this course would be um, up for a 13-ish day review. Um, we'll come back around next time. Are there any specific questions that um, that I can answer. I will give uh, the papers to Val so that everybody gets an electronic copy of the documents that um, Ms. Nova brought tonight. Is there a reason we, it's pass fail or pass no pass? Other than the grade. So I mocked it after the work experience credit, which is pass fail. Um, I felt like for me, a letter grade <coughs> would be more work, like I would expect more written work for the students to be doing. And really my intent behind this elective was to send the kids out in the community and get hands-on experience. Um, not so much papers or something that I was feeling like then had to be graded and, and uh, aligned to a, a letter grade. Well, what do you do about the student like me that just go over and kind of not do anything versus these Great girls that go That happened. <laughs> that happened. So what we did was um, our last coordinators, they would make sure every day they took attendance on the students. And so if kids were not showing up, then Christy and I sat down with those students and said, hey, if you're not, if you aren't going to come, then this isn't going to work for, for the for the elementary site, for us, and then we had to remove it out of the schedule. We had two students that we had to do that with. So the attendance piece we kept, we kept really on track with the students because we are honoring, you know, we're letting you go out into the community and we want to make sure that you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. Yeah. The other accountability piece that I'd add that I was impressed with in the proposal is that there's a communication piece with the hosting um, business or community partner, and then um, the standards align to essential skills, which are graduation requirements for students. So you couldn't get away with just going to 7-Eleven 
giving us their opinion. Yeah. It would be Pod Pantry though at Glencoe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be 7 Eleven, that would be the Pod Pantry Travis. Yeah. <laughs> just that never happen. happens. Um, so definitely, uh, you know, we made sure too that we just, we further discussed with our students what they were learning. Christy and I brought them in and, and talked to them about the, enjoying the opportunity, what they have learned. So there's that reflection piece on it. Um, they also rec recorded their hours and did a one-page reflection, and then as well so did their supervisor, which is in the paperwork. But I really wanted it to be embedded in the kids' schedules for more of an opportunity just to experience the world of work. And I think as we all work towards college and career pathways and we're infusing so much energy behind this work, I really see this just as a vehicle that we can continue to expand upon in other opportunities, and that's what Chrissy was speaking to a little bit, to just allow that time in their schedule for them to explore different career options and their skill sets as well before we send them off into, into the world. Um, I was going to say that um, I, I know that the, the importance of, of, I love the career and college pathway type of connection with that. I think that's fantastic. I also, again, think this is an opportunity where students are learning something above and beyond, as you pointed out, the book learning. Mm -hmm. And this is something that um, a lot of students have the desire to do, but their schedule doesn't allow it because they're doing the things that you had mentioned, the, the sports or the work or what they're needing to do. And so um, I think that civic you know, uh, responsibility and getting involved with the community around you is such a huge lesson. And so when students are able to do that, uh, they take more pride in, in what they're, with the, the work they're doing in the city they live in. So I think that um, it's phenomenal, and I know that there are students such as Lucas Heaton, and I'm, at Century, this kid should be getting lots of credit, <laughs> because he volunteers all the time and everywhere, yeah. but the experiences that he has um, working with senior citizens and all the different things that he does, those are things that are just making him a more well-rounded citizen, and when he goes off into college, yes, it does look better on his college application, scholarship application, they're able to see that. So I say bravo, I, I'm super impressed, and I only hope that it, that it grows. So thank you. Wayne? So it's a great uh, presentation. I, uh, in fact, I really get how it works with Blast. You know, uh -huh. it's very, I, I can see that. Yeah. Do you have a vision of how it works outside of, of that context of mm -hmm. students with students and you mentioned the fire department. Right. Clean fire engines or scrubbing fire hydrants or or just yeah. what what beyond blast for you so the, another reason why we wanted to make sure it's embedded in their school day is because a lot of the business hours are during the kids' school days, right? I and mean, so that's what's so difficult is when we say to go out into the community, a lot of times businesses close at 5 o'clock. So what I foresee is you know, we're able to give students small internship opportunities through the Hillsborough Chamber of Commerce in a wide variety of career pathways. So if we can expand upon that, and instead of offering 15 to 30 hour internships, if, if City of Hillsborough or if they're, uh, you know, FBI, if there's an if there's an opportunity for a student to go every other day and to be doing that hands-on learning, that's the one how I see it. Is us, me, you know, as we partner in college and career pathways, and we're bringing on more community partnerships. I really see this as the vehicle that we can present them to these businesses to say we have this model set up. We just need you to partner with us, and we'll give you these students for these hands-on opportunities. You know, there was a requirement. The city was was flexible because uh, mm -hmm. you already had an organization. I know as you as you touch more businesses, professional businesses that are carrying on. Uh, and they have requirements for connecting the students in either uh, I don't know what logistics will hit when you when you expand to a wider business. Have you touched on that with businesses and understand how to interact? Uh, I, I'm not sure what will come up. I, uh, mm -hmm. In my head, I'm thinking of I, I know Intel I look at, mm -hmm. uh, does uh, high school internships, but they do it through a. That they're hiring a student through an external third party temp agency or something, as I understand it. Mm -hmm. That's just one example of kind of needing a buffer to manage that with, a, with business organizations. Have you 
kind of explore the, the impacts and methods to get students into practical business opportunity? Okay. Part of what we're exploring with the College and Career Pathways project as a whole is um, organizing around career learning areas, like Brooke uh, mentioned with the Chamber of Commerce, but getting those partners at the table to discover what the challenges are. For example, we had uh, partners express interest from Kaiser in hosting student interns, but because of health and safety regulations, um, the students have to be of a certain age and have certain clearances and all that. So what we're looking for is creating all the opportunities by getting our partners and, and like the city uh, wrapped around our academic programs and figuring out what role they can play for students. So I can tell you that right away, uh, transportation and um, that type of age and sort of training um, challenge is a barrier that we need to address um, either through you know, resourcing it, or um, figuring out how to get students those experiences while they're in our K-12 um, program. And I don't see it, I, I see us being able to meet a lot of those challenges as soon as the community realizes how organized we are around creating these opportunities for our students. But we'd like to create the opportunity for any student in our high schools, especially to be able to participate in internships uh, before going off to college or career. Navigate the, the the paid or volunteer internship issues with with uh, for-profit businesses and I don't know what regulations there might be in terms of child labor or, uh, or there you can you can see how it uh, how it might go on. So, to my knowledge, we haven't in trouble for that yet. <laughs> Um, we'd like to avoid getting in trouble for that, but a uh, paid internship is not something that we're ruling out for students who are already in the workforce. And so um, it's on the table, I think, carefully, is how we'll proceed with that. Jane? I'm kind of curious, are we talking about two different things here? Because I'm hearing about internships with businesses, and I'm looking at this looking, it's community service. So I'm thinking when you're talking about the BLAST program, and you're talking about maybe opportunities with the help at the school-based health center, mm -hmm. maybe Habitat for Humanity. Mm -hmm. These are ideas, these are opportunities that are volunteer opportunities for students to get involved with during the school day that they might not be able to on the weekend or in the evening. Right. So are we talking about two different things here, or is he, is... We're talking yeah. about multiple different things. We've talked about community service, internship, mm -hmm. externship, um, mm -hmm. school to work, and so there are a yeah. lot of different layers. But what you're addressing question. here... This, this is purpose. specifically about community service Thank and the you. opportunity for students to do that during the school day. Thank Thanks. Yeah. And something that to know is that we have multiple nonprofit organizations that come to our high school every year that say we need your students and so this would be a really great alignment with the organizations that are coming with the Hillsboro Police comes, Saul comes, Home Place comes to this uh, event. Um, Christy helps me organize it. Friends of Retreats, Hillsboro Public Library. I mean, we already have these nonprofit organizations that are saying, we need your students. So if we can infuse then this elective and, and partner that with these organizations that are already coming to the table saying, please, we need your students, I see that as a great partnership. And so many of these organizations say, we need your youth because one, they have the technology skill set that we're needed, um, as well as the skill set of being bilingual. And uh, also, you know, the service, the, the classwork that they learn really aligns with a lot of the nonprofit organizations that come to us. So they have this skill set that's a perfect marriage for this um, elective. Adrian, that's um, oh, no, that's funny. Um, I love that you guys focus on the whole experience, that you're not, you know, when mom's death, I was kind of thinking, but I think it takes away from that natural experience mm -hmm. of relationship building with the kids and um, whoever, you know, supervising them. The, the, the way they're treated as paraprofessionals to me is like, wow, like the young girls who were dancers who were able to lead their own activity mm -hmm. in stretching. And I remember being a kid, and sometimes those teenagers, when they come to share something with us about health, exercise, nutrition, or behavior, yourself, for your younger kids, it's so much more impactful. It's almost like peer to peer. Because you look up to those high school kids, you know, and it's like, I'm getting ready to graduate. So I really, really love that piece. And I see how this can, you know, be replicated. Every employer has 
some niche that needs to be filled that you know it's to provide those opportunities that our high schoolers can discover talents that they never realized they have or before they go to school and say I want to be a teacher in real life ooh I can't handle more than three kids, you know, or that. Yeah. So these are the, like the, the apprenticeship, especially I think some of them said they were in child services, so you're learning the theories and then you can go and, you know, just don't start psychoanalyzing because you're good at it. <laughs> you, go too, you go too deep. But I think these experiences are, are very valuable getting out of high school because they offer you that. You're in between, you're in transition. Mm -hmm. You know, with one foot here and one foot there. Mm -hmm. So I just, I, I'm all over this. So. Okay. I love this idea. And I love that I have a, a student friend who was doing it, uh, working at Lasset Free Workers, and what a win win. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a win for our students who are serving and a win for our students who are being served. Mm -hmm. And that be able to serve more students through Lasset. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a good partnership. Mm -hmm. Um, a reminder to board members, so there's two course um, proposals that are on a less than 30-day review, so if you have questions between now and that less than 30-day time, send them to Travis. Thank yes. you. Yes, okay. please. Thank you so much for making time after you. your big senior oh, yeah. I appreciate that. All right, now we're going to go through some more first readings, which may not get a little pause. I don't think we're going to bring students with you faster. <laughs> so um, there was a, uh, a small law that was passed, uh, HB 2099, that requires um, that we modify um, policy IA instructional goals. As I took a look at it, uh, our policy looked nothing like what OSBA had recommended. Um, so. What I did is I, I split our policy, put in the OS, uh, OSBA recommended language in the middle, uh, and what you'll see is there are a list of requirements that our school district uh, commit to for comprehensive education. I didn't see any in there that seemed to contradict our values, um, but it's not under review, so if there's something that doesn't fit quite right, please let me know. The 2099 uh, House bill, only impacted um, item six. It changed um, foreign languages to world languages. So it was a very minor change in that house bill, but um, it required a significant new look on our policy. Any questions for Steve? And again, if you have more over your review period, you can send them. Okay. Do we have 30 on this or 30? I think they're all going to be that little 13. Yeah. Um, and especially since we decide, I mean, we are technically going to have that second board meeting in June, but I think we agreed that that would be just a budget hearing, so they are short periods. Um, and the next one is Casey, the student right and responsibility. Have to follow all those students when you can't leave. <laughs> First off, just special thanks to Val uh, working on all these policies, and it's a challenge sometimes to go back and forth with OSBA and get clarifications. <laughs> which one? Tell Val, appreciate you. Um, I have three policies: JF. JFA, Student Rights and Responsibilities, JFC, Student Conduct and Discipline, and JG, Student Discipline. All of these are the result of House Bill 2192 that was passed in 2013. It goes into effect this July. And really is what it does, it clarifies language. It removes the mandatory expulsion. I think uh, many of us remember the zero uh, tolerance policy for students who would bring a pocket knife to school or a toy gun that was in policy once. So it removes that, giving uh, school administrators more discretion on uh, the circumstances surrounding that. Uh, we have a lot of examples of students who um, were hunting over the weekend with dad and mom and had something in their backpack and forgot it was there. This kind of gives more discretion to the school administrators. Um, it really limits the expulsion to conduct that poses a threat to health and safety, repeated behaviors that have not responded to other interventions and expulsions that are mandated by law. It adds additional guidance to school districts for making decisions. Uh, 
adds a 10 day limit to complete the mental health risk assessment for students, which is a positive for us. It specifies that school policies are designated to impose discipline without bias. And another one is uh, requires districts to ensure that policies comply with state and federal laws concerning students with disabilities, FED, and IDA. Uh, first policy that you have is JF, JFA. Really, only the there's three add uh, words recommended by OSBA in number two, and uh, at the end uh, tend to add the word free, and then added employees to um, the summary down the bottom. Student conduct and discipline again, quite a lot of changes in here uh, meant to really clarify what can be disciplined and, and for how long, expulsion, et cetera, adds the uh, students with uh, special needs in there and gives more flexibility uh, to the schools. Spells out really um, all the discipline suspensions or expulsions that may include to clarify some of the old language, which uh, was not very clear for school districts based on the old policy that, that uh, was in, intact. Uh, moving on to the student discipline, again, a lot of suggested language uh, about circumstances and how House Bill 2192 will clarify um, how districts discipline students through policy and expulsion. Um, then go into all the details so that every single one you have that in front of you. Um, to answer questions about any specifics. Okay, so looking at the uh, student rights and responsibilities policy, one of the things I was struck by was that, you know, we do mention the right to privacy, this is, which includes privacy in respect to students' school records. Um, you know, we've had discussions about unreasonable search and seizure and other things like cell phones and such. Um, I, I'm not sure that it's supposed to go with this policy, but I was surprised that we didn't have anything in, in here on this. I know, Mike, you were, have been saying that we're going to get to that as a policy changes. Where does that fit in with these, or does it? So we're doing those at the June meeting, and then we're bringing back uh, three different policies uh, at the June meeting that all tied together. Um, I, I think, I guess I can answer that. It's just more specific. The electronics piece, piece the search and seizure piece, is more specific than this general. Policy. So uh, I don't know how else to answer your question other than that. It's, restate your question. What is the? I guess in my mind, you know, privacy is such a big deal um, in general. Right. Um, it's not really addressed very well in these rights that we're we're, we're taking the time to lay out the rights that students have. I grant you that it's. Uh, a modified set of rights that the right. person would have. But uh, I was just concerned when I just didn't really see a lot of, you know, I don't know, deference to that particular civil right that does not go away when they come into our doors. Right. I guess I would say there's another, I mean, there's a more specific policy around that issue mm -hmm. is what my response to that would be. And I would say just to add on to that, there's so many different circumstances when we're talking search and seizure that probably couldn't be all spelled out in this basic student's rights and responsibilities. That's why it's required that we have all those other specific policies for search and seizure, social media, et cetera, that um, have the platform to go into more detail. Well, I, I guess I accept that, but then I just wonder what What's the point of having this general document if it's all covered in more specific documents? I'm not questioning you for it, I guess, but maybe I am. Okay, okay, I am. But it's fine. Other questions? Okay, if you think of questions over the next 13 days, days. Casey's your back. <laughs> what do we have one? Yeah, let Steve get by without a question or more. Yes, and it's quick. Well, we're talking because there's only 13 days and I'm thinking about it. Yeah, I'll go back. So, it was in your policy line, these were all this itemized, the number of things were policies we stand behind in terms of delivering. And line 13, or at uh, point 13, it transports students safely to and from school. Is that implying something more than we need? It's not one of our goals, 
to universally provide all students transportation to and from school. Uh, is that what this bullet could in the future be read to imply? That uh, it's in our policy that you're supposed to transport my student. Yeah, I'd like to see some clarification in that about you know, we will transport all students who are legally required to transport. Right, the state law tells us who we transport. Yeah. And that we have per to Per as per ORS or something like that. Maybe yeah. we have to is dealt with some other place. But yeah. That was the only one that jumped out. Okay. I'd be happy to pursue that we'll along the way yeah. get some clarification. Okay, thank you. And the next one is um, policy JGAB about restraints and seclusion of lanes. Hello. Okay, so this is the first reading of policy JGAB, which is regarding the use of restraint and seclusion. Um, as you may or may not know, there's been a couple recent house bills that have driven a few changes in this um, in this policy, and that's House Bill 2939 and House Bill 2756, just for your reference. Um, there's a few minor wording changes in here, so those are not major and they don't change too much of the basic meaning of the bill, but if you go, or of the policy, but if you go to page two, number six, end of the middle paragraph to the highlighted area, um, the, the change there is that um, it just reminds us that any room used for seclusion of a student needs to fulfill all the legal requirements and then OAR is referenced there and also um, needs to AR and restraint and seclusion and the, the AR uh, on restraint and seclusion now aligns with both of the new house bills. Um, and then if you proceed further on down the bill, um, what you see is a list of requirements that's that schools are, or school districts are required to report to ODE and required to post publicly um, on their website. And so we actually already comply with this, but if you look under the Student Services website under the Documents section, that's where we post our uh, 2756 requirements for restraint and seclusion. And, um, other than that, the only major change to the reporting that we need to add that we're not already doing is, if you look at the very last page, page three of three, number 10, that's highlighted where it says the total number of rooms available for use by the district for seclusion. Um, that line, that's not something we report on right now, but we can add that, and that number starting July 1 is really going to be one. Uh, we have one room um, in the basement of Glen Cove that we'll be using for a program in which we collaborate with the ESP, um, and we need that for the safety of our staff and students. All other seclusion rooms in Hillsborough will have their doors removed as of July 1. So, have any questions? So well, I'm kind of curious about situations where um, classrooms are cleared right. for a situation. So right. from what I'm reading, it doesn't. This isn't. This doesn't um, include for that short period of time. It says to provide the stu student. So. Are you talking, you're probably talking about kind of the room clear procedure that we yeah. use sometimes. So that doesn't necessarily result in seclusion. Um, this, if that resulted in seclusion, that would be a situation in which the door is closed, all the doors to the classroom are closed, and a student is prevented physically from leaving with no adult or anybody in there supporting or assisting him or her. Um, typically, that's not the case when we do a room clear. We get students out of the way for their safety. Uh, however, generally, we have staff in the room managing the student. And is that recorded in some, is that required to be recorded, uh, reported for any? Well, it's not typically reported as a seclusion unless the student is physically prevented from leaving the room. Um, and in that case, it would be reported as a seclusion. Um, that's not typically the case. Um, it is reported as a restraint if one of our OIS whole procedures is used. So we use a system called the Oregon Intervention System. Um, ODE has a number of systems that are approved that districts need to choose from um, in order to physically intervene with students when necessary. And really, in our OIS system that we use, only about a third of the training is on physical intervention. The other two thirds of it is on basically de-escalation and 
um, verbal calming down techniques with students and things like that. So um, if we if we get to the physical part of the OIS, then that is that is reported. Any physical intervention is reported, and it will continue to be reported. And we are not stopping the use of using our OIS physical interventions. Thank you. Any other questions? And now, Burke and Record, if you have questions over the next 15 days, contact the lane. And the last first reading is admission of non resident students, Beth. Okay, so as we talked about in a recent uh, board meeting slash board session, there have been lots of changes around the interdistrict transfer rules and regulations, and so policy JECB specifically relates to the ways that students can transfer between districts. So basically we adopted most of OSBA's recommended language around this, which integrates uh, House Bill 2747-4007. And um, my recommendation when I brought it, kind of discussed it in SEC and what I'll share with you all is there's lots of different policies and administrative rules around the various transfer policies be they in district, between districts and whatnot, because there are so many changes going on and we fully anticipate another revamp coming up in the 2015 session, my recommendation would be that we just go with what's required to have in policy and kind of clear the decks on the rest, uh, try to manage the communication via our website with the most up-to-date information for parents, and then revisit kind of how we approach policy once we see what happens in the next legislative session. So that's my recommendation. I'd like to kind of clear out the um, non-mandated policies, ARs and whatnot, so that we can just get down to the basics, try to get through this for now, so. Any questions? I, I just had a question. The first paragraph, consent by affected boards. Uh-huh. It says, um, reserves the right to accept or reject non-resident students based on the availability of, now I'm specifically looking, looking at resources. And if, and if for, I'm just gonna give an example. We get five students, I need students at $30,000 $30, a piece. That's $150,000. Does this give us the right to say we don't have the resources? No. So we can't ask. Why did they? Why do they include that in there? Well, you can you can use what you anticipate your resources being prior to the announcement of any slots. Um, that's when you can kind of take it into consideration. But once you've decided, okay, we're going to open up and accept X number of students, it, at that point. You don't have a say in terms of who you get. You're required to educate whoever you get in that process. Right, but you can't say, like, I'll only take two IAP students. Right, and you can. That's mm -hmm. actually Unfunded mandates on like me. It's actually a good point that he brought up because it was talked about with um, our transitions program in, uh, in, in our district. It's a very well-known program throughout our county and so if other districts do not have a program up to that, it's it's very appealing to be able to offer those programs to their students to be able to say you have great opportunities here. So And we'd be glad to do it as long as we have the resources. Right. Okay, thank you. And same thing, if you think of other questions, send them to the best way. And then Mike is going to walk us through strategic plan highlights. Actually, each of our cabinet members is going to do that, but uh, what they're going to be focusing on is that uh, we just, we're wrapping up year three of the strategic plan, and what they're going to focus on is, you've seen the highlights throughout the year, so we won't spend much time on that, but really want you to focus on the recommendations for next year, just to start getting some of these um, ideas in your head, um, because we're going to be discussing that next month, and so we'll need your input next month in a more formal way, but wanted to expose you to these right now. So Steve, you want to kick us off a little bit? And then uh, um, anybody can go to our, our strategic plan portion of the website and click on year three strategic area highlights. And this will all be um, there. Won't we'll reference that up there because I won't be able to see it. Um, but with instruction, remember that there are three uh, main areas for our focus on design and implementing professional development opportunities. 
Our Ryan Standards Based Teaching and Learning Benefit Program model in professional learning communities, um, creating the curriculum resources that are necessary to implement um, guaranteed and viable curriculum, and then to invest in um, communication structures that um, create opportunities for shared decision making, uh, primarily around the teaching that we do. So um, this year, um, we provided our district philosophy on professional development, um, maintained a high attendance rate, um, provided ongoing training and coaching um, in each of the three categories. Um, we provided professional development on um, over 35 distinct topics, reaching over 1,000 uh, teachers, unduplicated. Um, maintained a log of feedback on all professional development sessions and, and uh, made the necessary adjustments based on um, and the negative feedback that we received. Um, going into area two, curriculum resources for, for uh, teaching, formative assessments, instructional technology, uh, pacing guides for every grade level uh, in elementary school and planned course statements for every course uh, that we provide um, in the Hillsborough School District. Uh, that's important because we align all of our formative assessments to those planned course statements so that what you get at Liberty is similar to what you get at, at Glencoe. Um, of course, aligned everything to common core state standards um, in preparing for the next generation science standards. Uh, provided the tech innovation grants for over 35 classrooms, um, a large amount of instructional resources um, cataloged and um, stored for teachers to have easy access to using some uh, new Google Doc um, frameworks that Don's brought uh, to us. Um, and then really um, moving our assessment warehouse um, into uh, a useful tool for everyday um, data analysis for our class and teachers. Uh, finally, the third area, um, we've uh, really made a focused effort to bring our teachers around the table to make the decisions about um, what their curriculum should look like and how we'll um, analyze progress over time. Um, and also creating opportunities for teachers, classified staff, parents, and students to give us feedback about how the year is feeling, how the work is feeling, and what we should do to uh, continue making progress. Um, recommendations for next year are to not add uh, any new work to our system, but to continue to refine the three areas that we've had. Um, continue to be very intentional about the professional development that has worked um, and that we're seeing um, a direct result in the classroom from. Um, continue to push um, the development of instructional resources and tools for our teachers to reduce um, the amount of work they have to do on their own. Um, and then strengthen our existing communication structure so that we continue to hone um, our systems of, of support for teachers so that it really does feel like support. So those are my recommendations that we'll spend more time on next time. Any questions for Steve? Perfect. Okay, thank you. So, um, in the area of engagement, we had a couple of main focus areas, one being the utilization of a variety of different media tools and channels and outlets to communicate with stakeholders. Uh, we've made a concerted effort in the area of social media this year with the launch of our district mobile app that has over 3,500 downloads, which is great. Uh, we've more than doubled our followers and likers on Facebook and, and Twitter, and we've definitely ramped up the number and variety of stories and positive pictures that we're pumping out on those channels, and I think that's definitely, you can see that in, in the response we're getting from folks, which is great. Um, we've also been able to, with the continued assistance of our volunteer coordinators, really capitalize on a lot of community partnerships and opportunities. One thing that was just really great that we got to do this winter and spring was an increased partnership with the Assistance League, and they're the folks who run our Operation School Bell program and have since the late 90s. And up until this year, that's always focused on our elementary students, where they've gone to what's called a clothing closet. And granted, they've been able to get new clothing, a warm jacket, a shoe voucher, which is wonderful. Those are all pre-purchased items. Um, 
and in thinking about how that system would work for students that are older, in middle and high school, it's just not as easy to do kind of that bulk purchasing. So they've worked in partnership with Fred Meyer and have been able to offer shopping nights for some older students. So we were actually able to serve 209 mostly middle school but also some high school students this spring, students in need, uh, with a shopping trip where they could go and pick out the clothing that was going to work for them, which is great, and that was a value of more than $26,000, and that's gonna continue next year, which we're very excited about. Um, the other focus area for us is in terms of um, increasing the number of opportunities uh, and variety of ways that people can engage with us really been making a concerted effort to track all those different activities this year and how many people came exclusive of the staff members running the events and, and board members who were there to observe. And um, we've had 87 different events this year that have um, engaged over 2,200 patrons. And granted, some of those may have been people that came to multiple events, but still, sure. there have been a lot of opportunities for people to get information on a wide variety of topics to be heard, to um, get the types of information that they want and need about our district, which is great. Um, so looking forward to continuing that, and a lot of that is thanks to the work of the instruction group and the, and the equity group. I mean, all these different groups that are really working to, to reach out to folks have been helpful in that. So as you know, we had communications audit, and hopefully we're within days of receiving the results of that, really anxious to see uh, the types of information that that will uh, provide to us as well. And as we look forward to next year, I, I too would like to not see a large deviation from those plans, but you know, kind of a honing in, I think, um, continuing to focus on new media, <laughs> it's not new anymore, but different multimedia avenues for communicating with folks is, is powerful. Uh, more videos would be great for us, I think, to really have our students tell our story, as we can <laughs> attest to based on tonight's meeting, when the students tell the story, it's far more uh, impactful and engaging. Also, to kind of have a more integrated, streamlined communications plan in terms of making sure that all of our publications and materials and websites and whatnot have a consistency about them. When you see them, that you know you're looking at things that have been produced by the Hillsborough School District, hopefully generating some talking points that can really give people that uh, top three most important things about the district, and then you can drill down and drill down based on your interest level. But So just really hoping to kind of solidify some efforts in that way, and obviously continue to assist my colleagues in working on college and career pathways and working on preparing for the potential of that next bond campaign. Any questions for Jeff? Uh, great job. I mean, what we've done this year compared to, say, last year, I mean, it's, it's great. Especially the getting 184 followers for my Scott. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and the other thing was, and, and you mentioned on year four here, continue improving and standardizing school websites. Uh -huh. that's, that's a big deal with me just because volunteers in the community trying to make that connection with that elementary school that's down the block and so they try to go to their website and they can't find out any information so if we can really focus in that area uh, i think it'd be helpful for the for the non-child family in, in our community that's trying to help yeah the, Glen the new and improved blanco website is Awesome. Right. Yeah, most it of the high went school. Vermont, especially on a tablet from being not functional on a tablet to like accessing everything. Yeah, see elementary schools that don't have a volunteer don't have a volunteer and they move on the next year and the thing goes down. Okay. Thank you, Beth. Equity. So um, we have two areas of focus this year in equity, and the first one has to do with developing and implementing um, professional development to meet the needs of our diverse community. And I'm happy to report that we have had over 330 staff 
community members and partners trained this year in a variety of trainings. Um, as I had reported earlier, actually the demand is greater than what we could actually provide um, for our staff, and we focused on reaching out to the community this year. So um, that was a really nice partnership to bring community members into our trainings. Uh, we've also focused on administrators. We had three equity-focused fo dialogue sessions uh, facilitated by John Linson with our administrative group that really were a nice vehicle for us to have some shared conversations about the work that we're doing in, in the district. Uh, the second focus area is to implement and refine our recruitment, hiring, and retention processes uh, to support the instructional needs of all of our students. Um, we have developed multiple partnerships to help us with this recruitment. It's becoming highly competitive to get the best teachers districts are hiring now. So it's, it's kind of a different ballgame with this recruitment and it's extremely important that we not only recruit but retrain, we retain the staff we have. So our partners include Western Oregon University, Portland Met, um, Metro Education Partnership, Portland State, ODE, Portland Community College, and a new one this year was the African Youth Organization um, that we're reaching out to in our local community. Um, to try and recruit uh, employees from them. We've been collecting the data on why staff choose to work in Hillsborough and why staff leave Hillsborough. Um, and it's, it's been interesting data that we're going to continue to disaggregate so we can really use it as we strategize um, how we're going to be recruiting, where we're going to recruit, what strategies, what our marketing plan needs to be as we're recruiting for a district working really hand in hand with our communications department to really sell this district to bring more and more people in. And then what do we need to continue to do to retain the staff that we've got? So it's going to be really, as we start getting more longitudinal data, it's going to really help us to inform our recruitment and retention practices. We've got the Oregon Education Minority Education Re Educator Retention Grant this year. Uh, Brooke Nova, the, the partnership with Brooke has been wonderful because she's actually been a partner and Adriana's on that, that committee to help us actually look at school to work as we're looking at retention also. And it's that kind of grow your own. We've got the community. We just need to reach out and develop that community. And so working with Brooke and, and all of her expertise has really been valuable for us on this grant. So we're almost at the point where we're going to submit our recruitment and retention plan for next year to ODE um, with the hopes of getting another grant to actually implement it. We've got three focus schools, a theater, we've got Hill High, South Meadows, and Henry. So those will be the schools that we're going to focus next year on with our new, hopefully, our retention grant with ODE. So we're pretty excited about that opportunity. We also, Office of Equity helped work focus groups. We were reaching out to our Hispanic families and parents to talk to them and have conversations about how we're meeting their needs and are we improving on, on how we're meeting the needs of, of that community. Um, and we're getting some positive feedback from them that they're seeing some changes in our, in our schools. We think that's a direct result of the equity training and work that we've been doing um, across the district. So next year, the recommended focus for next year that we'll be talking about later on this month will be to continue to meet the needs of our various groups in the school district, expanding our PD opportunity, developing some of our own PD opportunities around equity for um, staff, parents, and the community. So putting the equity work that, that's being done in each school and department, knowing that that's kind of unique from school to school and department to department, how do we continue to create that inclusive educational environment? Um, continuing to work with ODE towards recruitment and retention, and then to create opportunities to connect with our community, to better connect with our community through outreach efforts focused on hiring a diverse workforce. Like I said, we've got a lot of that right here in our community. We need to reach out and develop that. Any questions? Okay, thank you, Debbie. The facility strategy um, area this year was focused primarily on uh, utilizing our long-range planning committee to uh, stay abreast of all the activity, development activity that's happening um, in the community. So long-range planning committee met monthly uh, throughout the year. Um, we, were at, we have members from both the city and the county who uh, kept us up to date on a monthly basis of where the development process was. Um, we also, as a result of that partnership with the city, um, were able to um, become aware of the, the development that was happening within our, our current district, which led to the whole boundary adjustment process. Um, 
We are also working with the South Cooper Mountain um, development folks, um, trying to make sure that we're a part of that process. Uh, we continue to work on our high priority maintenance project list. Um, we have made some progress in that area, um, given the limited resources we have, and we'll continue to do that. Um, the second focus area was on developing a, an equitable learning environment um, template that we can use to measure all of our building classrooms against, um, recognizing that we've got brand new schools that have lots of um, you know, bells and whistles and some of our older buildings that don't. And what is the, that baseline that we want to see in all of our buildings? We're continuing to work on that process. We've got some um, field trips scheduled for this summer. We'll, we'll be taking the um, work group out into the buildings to see both ends of the spectrum to help us determine what that um, baseline needs to be. In terms of uh, recommendations for next year, we will continue to use the long range planning committee um, to stay abreast of community development and facility maintenance issues. And we will complete the draft plan for the baseline standard um, for the equitable classroom and then use that to develop costs that we're going to need for the next bond issue. Uh, just one question just relating to the presentation before. So do you have a plan to use some benchmarks like the one that sixth grader designed to help the office baseline technology standard? On the technology piece? Yeah, that would be part of this, yeah. Any other questions? Okay. Okay. We've talked uh, quite a bit this spring about our uh, focus area about uh, development and implement implementing the district wide anti bullying and harassment campaign. Uh, so everybody's well versed in that. Um, we are continuing with that process meeting again tomorrow with the students to talk about next fall's implementation. Uh, feel good about the track we're on and moving forward towards the fall and getting some concrete plans uh, with each year and then carrying that down through the levels that we've discussed. Um, focus area two, it's been uh, busy with the emergency procedures. I think um, a couple of the highlights uh, our safety summit has been uh, starting to get traction statewide as a venue to talk about issues in, in schools in Oregon today. We open that up to uh, counties, have guest speakers, and talk about how we implement our emergency procedures and, and everything that we do. Um, one of the other big things that we have really um, taken a next step this year is our student threat assessment team where we have actually tracked all of our student threats this year really for the first time and, and are kind of a leader in the county and the state for tracking so we know how many issues we've dealt with and the results of those so we can begin to formulate more data around that and best practices. We have a big uh, parent unification drill that we're planning for this summer so we're not there yet but in August we will take you back on the uh, full-scale active shooter drill that we did a couple of years ago at South Meadows. We'll be law enforcement. It will be one of the first of its kind around the area uh, to do, so it'll be interesting uh, to see how it all plays out and develop a plan for that. Uh, many school districts have been close to having a parent education. We're no different. And it'll be really beneficial for us to see how that uh, works in action. I, I know that law enforcement is excited to see how it's all going to play out and get that all the kinks worked out so theoretically we can have a, a solid plan. I've done a lot of work with that. I think uh, moving forward for next year is really the important year for our anti-bullying harassment campaign. We're going to see how our students can take what they've done so far and get it down to the rest of the student body and the rest of the district. So a lot of work to be done there. Um, high standards set for the younger uh, Youth Advisory Council students. There are a lot of seniors that left and new ones that are coming in, so it'll be interesting to work with them. And then, uh, again, for the recommendation, continue to look at our practices uh, that we're doing for emergency preparedness and our, our, and our strategies sur surrounding student safety and making sure that we're implementing our best practices and are, are doing things that benefit our staff and students.
Any questions for Casey? Hello, our young lady friends. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Do we cover them all? Do we have one more? Yeah. <laughs> no. You, if you're grabbing the microphone, I said, can I miss one? No. I'm next. You are next. We're ready. You ready? All yeah. right. So um, May, June are obviously very busy times for the whole district. Business office is no exception. We're wrapping up um, the fiscal year. Um, payrolls are getting ready for their four payrolls that they run in June. Um, we've got the new um, insurance rates that have just come out from OEBB. We're trying to work incorporate those. Um, wrapping up all the grants, the fiscal year in on all the grants. So very busy time in the business office, um, but we feel good about where we are. Um, thought we had a budget approved, but we're gonna, <laughs> we're gonna do that one more time. So uh, let's go. Anyway, Janine? The, the grant part kind of sparked a, a question in me, um, and it was talking about the end of year balances, and I was wondering, you know, sometimes you hear about in school buildings um, this use it or lose it type policy that they have given so much money and they have to use it, otherwise it goes back. Mm -hmm. So does it go back to the general fund to go? The grant money you're talking about? I see, I think it's not. I think I'm just speaking of, right. uh, so it just brought that thought. Those to grants country. are each their own yeah. entity. Most yeah. of them, federal and state grants, are on a 14 to 18 month cycle. So. We have time at the end of the year to spend the remainder. Right. We usually try to get those, especially the state and federal grants, um, to last us for 15 months so we can get through the summer period. Okay. Um, but the, the, the other money that is given to school districts, like the building discretion, the building funds, um, if they don't use that money, not grants, if they don't use that money, it goes back to general fund? For the last six years, yes, that money has rolled back into the general fund. We're just right now, um, in fact, the memo will go out tomorrow morning. We're going to be um, carrying over a portion of those building discretionary funds um, at the building level. So if a okay. building has um, money left over in their discretionary funds, that can carry over in the next year. Uh, that's news. Um, the principals don't know that yet. So. <laughs> Without impact to their next year's budget. Correct. Mm -hmm. And you said just a portion? Correct. Mm -hmm. well, would, my question, if I was a principal, why wouldn't you get it all? That's a fair question. Well, I can tell you the genesis of this. It was back in the day, we used to plug in, we give each building principal a per student allocation for discretionary supplies. They get an additional allocation for um, the number of uh, special ed kids that they have in their building. They get a, another allocation for the number of ELL kids that they have in their building. And we also gave each elementary school $5,000 that was targeted toward technology. Uh, middle schools got a little bit more, and high schools got a little bit more. Um, then they were allowed to carry that money over for up to three years. So an elementary school could generate $15,000. The idea was that they could target towards a bigger purchase. That's the model that we're using. We didn't plug any money into their budget this year, but we are going to allow them to carry some funds forward. How much? What percentage? Um, right now, for next year, it will be $5,000 at the elementary level, um, $7,500 for a middle school, and $10,000 for a high school. And the idea, again, is that they can carry that over for up to three years, so they can hopefully target that as something that will impact student achievement. Any other questions? Perfect. Thank you Good very question. much. <laughs> next is HCUHEA, who'd like to go first? <laughs> <laughs> Hi, so um, representatives from HEA meet monthly, and this month the information that my reps brought back from the buildings was focused on the added budget funding proposals. So the, here's some of their feedback. 
Um, we applaud the efforts toward reduced class sizes and all the steps, big or small, toward that effort. We agree that STEAM additions are important to our curriculum. Um, we hope to see inquiry into the efforts currently being made to integrate the concepts. Uh, stipends may help the teachers want to know that this might also translate into support, especially resources for what we do now. We're happy to see a priority placed on time for collaboration among staff. As you know, hours for classified staff have been reduced to the point that our instructional aides are basically arriving with our students and leaving with them. We feel like years that are spinning separately and energy is lost because if you could just put the teeth of those gears together so they mesh, you get a lot more uh, energy. And um, finally, we question keeping any reserves from this additional funding. The money for additional hours for classified is not going to begin to answer our need for collaboration, uh, especially as we move toward inclusion of all of our students uh, in uh, the least restrictive environment. The students who are in our classrooms now need that support. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, Eric couldn't make it today, so I'm filling in for me again. Uh, a lot of the things that I really want to, that PC wants to bring to the table is some gaps in communications that we have seen. Um, the snow days, Kerfuffle, I think, is the best description that, uh, that I can describe about it. There's a lot of people who didn't know what was going on. They didn't know, and um, HR and HCU came out with a joint memo. Not everyone quite understood, and their supervisors didn't necessarily help them through that path. Uh, there's still a bunch of people that don't quite get it, but we're trying to field those questions, and I know everyone's been very um, understanding for that one. Uh, I think a lot of this, um, this communication is, comes from kind of a, a general sense that classified aren't necessarily included in the communication process. It's we either get shot an email or some other vague information with, you know, a lot of classified staff don't have enough time to check their email. They miss important information. They don't have time to have a sit-down meeting with their supervisors. They're not always um, invited to uh, staff meetings, usually because they're scheduled at times that they are not on the clock. So there's a lot of issues around that, and, and I think a lot of staff would benefit from additional hours. And we're in that season right now where people, where principals are starting to reallocate how hours are placed, and we see a lot, we see, not a lot, but some staff have been reporting to us that they are getting 15, 20 minutes, half hours sliced off their time. A 7.5 is getting cut down to a 7. A six and a half is getting cut down to six. And, and we, we find it kind of odd that we have all this additional, we have this additional money that's being invested, but there's still these individual people who are still not seeing the benefit of that. They're still getting cut. You know, 15 minutes is still a cut to people. And it does make an impact, especially for some of these people. So um, I just want to say that we need to keep working on communication. And I urge everyone at all levels to just Remember, even though you know it, you've told a billion people about it, it doesn't mean everybody has heard the message. Thank you. Thank you. Superintendent. All right, thank you. So, great student presentations tonight. I uh, love you guys at Century and, uh, and also Jackson. I really, I'd be remiss, though, if I didn't uh, mention the benchmarking that Eric has brought up a few times. Uh, we are well aware of the techniques that we have in our district. And we, the fact of the matter is that we've been in six years of pretty drastic reductions. And that doesn't mean we're not aware of the tech needs. That means that we're able to fund our tech needs. We've got $500,000 going towards infrastructure this coming kind of year. Um, with that money, we're working to, to put in virtual desktops to prolong the use of the machines that we have. Um, we are doing server upgrades. We're, we're, adjusting for greater wireless access. So that's a lot of what the, what the infrastructure money is being spent on. Remember that the presentation tonight was a sixth grade point of view. Um, and with that sixth grade point of view, um, he's advocating for removal of the computers from the network to have greater flexibility. Um, he went online and found a server that he thought would work. 
and um, this was all before his visit here and his conversation with Don. The point of having him here this evening, not what it wasn't to um, have him give us the right answers. The point of having him here this evening was to um, show that students are advocating for more technology use, and they've got they've got some great ideas out there, and that's what the point of it was. As we mentioned earlier, as I mentioned earlier tonight in the work session, um, we do have we've had a tech vision. We've, it's funding that's been the issue for that. Um, we've had to alter it yet again as the textbook as the bond failed, and um, and I just want to say we are thrilled to have Don Wolf. He is very confident. He provides very confident leadership. He's got incredible vision. Um, he's, his tech savvy and knowledge is second to none. Very thrifty as well. And so um, I, I don't want you to think that uh, we're not aware of our tech needs. That, that's not the case. Um, it's, there's a bigger picture there, and I would urge you to have a conversation with Don if there's any specific questions that can be answered. Um, on another note, just to, just thanks to the board for it. They're, they've been out a ton these last, this last week or so. Our retirement party, um, visits and math classes, um, special ed tour, which was great. Thank you Ellen, for that. Um, prize patrols and graduations yet to come. So thank you for the many hours that you're putting in and many more to come in the next couple weeks. Thanks. I think we started that way last time. We'll start this way this time. Thank you for your... Yeah. Um, I just want to say it's good to be back here in person again. <laughs> but, uh, thanks for all the well wishes and the flowers all this time. Again, yeah. um, I'm much just uh, good night and wonderful meeting and love for the presentation, more student presentation. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, it's been a phenomenal few weeks uh, getting to experience kind of the best that all students put out uh, visiting the highlights were in. Uh, well, there's a science fair for the elementary that uh, just really stood out, the amazing things that kids think of to, to test and experiment with and to learn about. Uh, stepping up to, uh, to senior, uh, uh, what do you call them, uh, the senior uh, dem uh, showcase nights, uh, various high schools, uh, showing that progression of uh, how the critical thinking uh, has steps up another notch or two as you uh, as you see these uh, young men and women just expanding their horizons and, and putting their ideas that they learned to use it's been really incredible to, to share with that so it's been a great season and it'll uh, be wonderful graduation time looking forward to it uh, yeah, the, the mariachi uh, people that I just reminded me to remind you that I used to be a mariachi dancer we just had picture too. No, uh, I'd like to. I think one of our problems with communication is we've got so many good things happening. You go through that list that we just went through for the last year, and it's just item after item after item after item, and that doesn't include what's happening in the classrooms. And, and so I think that's our real problem, is how do we condense that and get that out and communicate that. That's the um, Jenny, um, I just wanted to say that um, I'm excited as well for the graduation ceremonies. It's, uh, again, as I said before, they, they each have their, their, their flavor, and it's exciting to see the, the presentations that they put on um, for their students. So I, I always enjoy that. Um, get to participate in BizTown in some interviews at Witch Hazel this week, and uh, the the, um, the powwow that's going to um, take part on um, Friday, I believe, and um, Friday night. So um, there is there's a lot of great things that are going on in the district, and I'm just so incredibly impressed by these student presentations. I mean, yes, that brought me to tears at some points because it it is just. Uh, they're the bread and butter of, of what we do. So um, I, I, uh, I thank all who organized that to happen, and uh, and thank you. And I wanted to I wanted to take a moment to talk just about the leadership that we've had on the board. I just appreciate. I've had Monty as a vice chair, and Kim as the chair, and um, I, I appreciate having the. Um, opportunity to have discussions that when, uh, you know, I'm not seeing something some way and someone can feel like they can come to me and have that discussion on a very respectful level and 
Um, I just really appreciate it. And, and the time that you guys have been putting in um, at the events, I mean, I just got an email, you know, from Tom Gomes, the, the board members going, and I know that it's not just about planning these meetings, it's not just about sitting here, it's about understanding how these meetings work and the rules that are behind it and everything um, with um, and also the fact that you're out there in the community you're doing things that are, are the face of the board in the community so it's more than just as we sit here so I just want to thank you very much for that I appreciate it and uh, look forward to a good week Wow, well first off, thanks everyone for sticking with us so late. Um, this was a fun evening. I really enjoyed those presentations. And so, uh, and also, I want to say I appreciated going to visit the math classes. That was very instructive. Oh, I meant to mention this earlier, I'll briefly do it here. Um, even the kids who didn't have technology at home were really jazzed about having the, uh, uh, this new process you know, in their classes. They're really hoping that we can continue this in, in this program and do uh, good things with this experiment and do it forward. So I, I, I don't know if what's in the cards for like those particular four classrooms in their iPads, or I'm sorry, their uh, Google uh, Chromebooks. But um, I really saw some really neat things, so I'm just looking forward to seeing where that program can go. Um, and finally, um, with graduations also comes retirees, and it was fun to go to the retirement celebration. Um, not every um, staff member who is retiring is able to attend, um, but there are um, many beloved teachers leaving us, and bus drivers and classified staff and, um, leaving us this year, and um, the one that's near and dear to my heart, I've been volunteering in her classroom since Allie was a third grader. And, I will especially miss her. Um, I just also received an invitation for all of you. Tomorrow night is the Fame Night at Century High School, which is much like a senior night. It's um, media, music, choir, theater, and visual arts. It is from 6 to 8 p.m. And I only received it today, so I'm telling you all now. You have a great evening. That's one more fun last senior event. And with that, we are adjourned.